today we are super excited. It's an honor. It's an honor to get to have here in the studio with us, Julie Murray. For those of you who don't know, Julie is Maura Murray's sister. Mara has been lost in many ways in the coverage yeah. of her own story. And she's been seen as a character and not as a real human. And that was something that I wanted to make sure everyone heard. What made Mara special was she was so humble, even though she was so talented. What makes most sense to you at this point after thinking about everything over and over again for 20 years? Is there one theory or idea that you've really landed on? I think she got into a vehicle and I think whoever she got into that vehicle with did her harm. People ask me all the time, what can I do to help? What can I do to help? And I tell them, just keep talking about Mara, share a missing flyer, engage with content that's victim-centered. Things like that go a long way. Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome back to Mile Higher Podcast, episode 289. And today we are super excited. And it's really... um, It's an honor. It's an honor to get to have here in the studio with us, Julie Murray. Welcome to the show. Hey, guys. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, my gosh. Of course. For those of you who don't know, Julie is Maura Murray's sister, um, who is someone that we have talked about many times over the years. I think if you are into true crime at all, you have at least heard of this case and probably have many questions like we all do. So we wanted to have the opportunity to take, you know, to answer some of those questions that people have. I mean, some of them can't be fully answered, but who better to tell the story than Julie herself? Um, Which also I just wanted to quickly shout out Julie has just come out with a new podcast called Media Pressure, which is excellent. It's so good. By the time that this episode goes live, I think episode five will be out. Right. It's excellent. So if you are looking for an overview on the case, I would definitely check it out. It's going to be eight episodes total and then possibly a QA. and a Is that correct? Right. Eight total. And then we'll have a QA and a episode. Yep. Yeah. Which if you want, we can go ahead and link a... Q&A form or whatever you guys are doing for that. Um, Sarah Turney, many of you are familiar with her. She's also producing the podcast. It's She just started her own media company called Voices for Justice Media. And this is the, the first of many podcasts to come. So today we are going to be going over the case. Obviously, we have talked about it many times. It was one of the first cases that I covered. So like I said, you know, getting to talk to Julie here is really a kind of full circle moment for me. It's, I never thought I would actually get to speak with you and hear everything from you. And um, one thing I wanted to point out is over the years, there's been endless coverage on this case. And there is a lot of misinformation out there, even from really reputable sources. So even in the past, you know, when we've covered it, we haven't gotten everything completely right because we thought we could trust, you know, normally reputable news sources. And that turns out to not be the case. So that's why we wanted to bring Julie here today to to clear up a lot of that and, you know, really bring the story to you guys in her own words. Yeah, I'm so happy for the opportunity to to come on here and do some of that. I've gotten things wrong myself within my own sister's case. And as long as you have the ability and the awareness to self-edit and take accountability, And as better information surfaces, be able to change your um, theory and and not be married to it, which is something that happens in my sister's case a lot is people become married to a certain theory Mm -hmm. and discount any new or better information. And so that's one of the things that I've dedicated myself in being more public to try to provide better information more context and get to some of the nuances of my sister's case because i mean you you both know it's full of nuance oh yeah yeah it really is i mean it's just been really interesting to take a look at it again now um after speaking to you and really clear up some of the things that we thought for so long were accurate because they're reported in so many different places 
Um, so yeah, it's it's really a great opportunity for us to to hear the whole story from you, not only for our audience, but really for us, because this is a case that we have both followed for so long. It is one that really got me interested in true crime. Um, one that I've spent, you know, not as many hours as you, but countless hours thinking about, and I just have endless questions. So I wanted to to jump in here. Obviously, um, you know, we don't have to go through the entire case, but as much gonna... as you feel comfortable with, yeah, I was just thinking before we kind of jump into things. Sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. No, no, you're good. I was just thinking, let's let's talk a little bit about the podcast because I think that's really yeah. what what you've done and what you've created and what we've listened to so far, I think has been, it was eye-opening for me because like you've been saying, there's a lot of things that have been misreported and I think you're providing a valuable service to the public, a valuable service to your family to be able to get out there and tell your the story as as it happened to you guys and i think that's what was really missing from the information that was out there is everything's kind of you know information's come by random ways some ways we have no idea where this even came from but all, now we're really getting the inside look at the murray family and how everything unfolded and to hear from your family members you know your father fred your brothers and you know friends and those close to Tamara is I, I think it's going to do a lot of good for the case and I think it's also going to right a lot of the wrongs that have happened in this case because we're talking about a disappearance from 2004 so we're talking about the 20 year anniversary uh, was just a few weeks ago and so that's a lot of time and so would you just kind of tell everybody how the podcast came about and yeah. why, why now? Why now release this podcast after all of these years? Well, an, a number of different reasons. But the first and most important reason was I was approached by Sarah Turney, who we all know and love. Mm -hmm. And she presented this, at the time, I thought, wild idea of what do you think about telling Mara's story in your own words on this network that I want to put together where victims and families are essentially taking back their narratives. And at first I thought to myself, I'm not cut out to do that. I, I'm just a regular person. I'm just a sister with a missing sister. And after I thought about it, I said, this would be a great opportunity to tell the story in full, share our lived experience, which we have a vast amount of, of over 20 years. And I agreed. And so that's what kind of started. It was all Sarah's vision of presenting these tragedies by the people who knew and were closest to the investigations. And I think what you're seeing is people are really is resonating with people because what's missing in my sister Mara's story after 20 years of coverage, endless coverage is who she really was. Mm -hmm. And I'm the only one in my family can are the only ones that can tell the stories about what she was really like. And that's powerful. And so I, I said, Sarah, yep, let, I'm, I'm in, let's do it. I didn't know at the time <laughs> exactly what I was getting myself into <laughs> uh, with all the work that goes on behind the scenes in creating a podcast, but it was so therapeutic. It was cathartic for everyone in my family to give Mara some of her humanity back that's been stripped away in all of the coverage. And people are enjoying it. People are telling me, hey, I really feel like I hear Mara in this podcast, which was the point. So that's kind of the origin of how Media Pressure started. And I'm just so excited because Mara is season one and there'll be other seasons that will cover other cases told by the ones that knew the victim, the victims. Yeah, that's what I really enjoyed about it too. You know, having followed so much coverage on it over the years. It was so nice to hear more about Mora and the person that she was, hear little stories, hear from her friends, hear from all of your family. I mean, that's that's what was so interesting to me. Right. And Mara's been lost in many ways in the coverage yeah. of her own story. Yep. 
and she's been seen as a character and not as a real human and that was something that i wanted to make sure everyone um heard who the real person was at the center of this tragedy and also to share some of my lived experience because i've been in this for 20 years now and i've learned a lot i made a lot of mistakes and sharing that with the world and being vulnerable is powerful and you know it might just help the next family navigating a, a tragedy no oh, i think it definitely will because like we were talking about earlier today, there are so many families out there who have just been thrown into this world, uh, never thought they would be in this situation and don't really know how to navigate. So I think it's really important to hear from people like you and from Sarah and so many others who have, have already navigated, tried to figure it all out and have learned so much along the way and sharing that information and getting to look up to you, I think is is really valuable for so many families out there more than you can even imagine. Yeah. I mean, when, when you have a tragedy strike, you don't get handed a guidebook. Here are the things that you should do. Here are the things you shouldn't do. Right. Well, I've been there, done that. I've already made all those mistakes. And so hopefully I can reach uh, the next family and, and help them navigate. Because you don't know what you're doing. You're just, you're just doing the next thing. Yeah. And Well, how can you in that moment? I mean, right. your focus is on what just happened to your family. How can you think about all of these other things that are unfolding that you've never experienced before it's just it seemed i can't even imagine how overwhelming that experience was for you and your family and to try to you don't have time to think about like oh is this person trying to like take you know are they really trying to help me or are they trying to get something from me and so i i just want to commend you for you know it takes a lot of confidence and and really just bravery to put out this type of personal experience and story out to the internet to the world and kind of open your family up to whoever's out there you know listening i think that takes you know not everybody can do that not everybody's comfortable doing that but i think it's amazing that you guys you know you're like you know what screw it everybody else thinks like we're gonna get this out there and because at the end of the day this is about mara this is about her story and that's what matters it's not what everybody else thinks and and hopefully you know, the goal of this is to hopefully drive more leads, tips, things like that. And ultimately, you know, we're all hoping for some sort of resolution in, in her case, as I'm sure you guys are. So, yeah, and it's already paying off within the release of the first two episodes. We're getting tips in. We're getting viable tips. That's crazy. After 20 years. Wow. Yeah. Incredible. On a cold case, we're getting tips because people are realizing that this isn't going away. And also, over the course of 20 years, relationships change, loyalties change. People are seeing the coverage, hearing my family and those closest to the investigation speak, and realizing, hey, that little thing that I thought was insignificant, I'm going to just report it just in case it's that missing piece to this puzzle mm -hmm. to help get resolution. And arguably one of the most well-known missing person cases ever yeah you know so that's a really great point and why it's so important no matter how long the case has been uh cold right to continue talking about it too, because time does change things i mean it, it changes things on the investigation side of things as well as like you said with people like people change their relationships change so how they felt in 2004 might be far different than how they feel now and maybe they've been withholding information because of x y or z and now they feel comfortable sharing that with authorities and that could just be that that missing piece as you said so mm -hmm. yeah that's that's super important and, i mean that's why we you know as a show have really tried to focus on the the unsolved cases because we we've learned that it is so important to keep talking about these cases for those very reasons so um and obviously you guys are are really connecting people to Mara. And that's that's what I think really, really helps is when people feel more connected to the victim and they feel like, oh, okay, I know more about her than just the mystery surrounding her disappearance. I think everybody's gotten so wrapped up and it's almost this lore that exists around the case, which is so bizarre. I understand why it happens because, you know, the media and, you know, investigation discovery and, you know, all of these media outlets really kind of focus 
you know, they're like spend five minutes on her backstory. And then it's like the rest of the episodes about the mystery and who could have been involved in theories and things like that. So that creates this, this almost fantasy environment that everybody gets sucked into and, and focuses on that. But you guys are really, you guys are focusing on that, but also going back and really letting people see an inside look into your family really. And, and what it was like growing up with her. So I think that's really cool. Yeah. And I'm glad that that's what you got from it because that's what I was trying to, to express. And one thing I'll add on that is the way to warm up a cold case is to get new leads and tips. And so this is just another avenue that we're finding is helpful in that because it's already happening. We're yeah. getting leads and tips and that is what we need for a cold case. In all cold cases, yes, we need awareness. We don't want Mara to be f forgotten about. She's not going to be. But we also need something to pursue. Mm -hmm. And so we're seeing that now, which is incredible. And there are a lot of things being done behind the scenes on the case to this day. So I don't want people to have the idea that this is just unsolvable. Because it's absolutely not. We could we could really see the answers that you guys so desperately want at any time. And you can never give up hope. Yeah, that's so true. I, I believe the case is solvable. This is just the tip of the iceberg on what we're doing. We're doing as a family with professionals, a ton of stuff behind the scenes. And we've always been doing that for 20 years. Just some of it's not responsible to put out there on social media. Yeah. And that's fine. Um, but we are, we're just, we're pulling out all stops and this is yeah. just another, another avenue and it's working so far. Did yeah, you great. ever, before you decided to do the podcast, did you go to law enforcement and the authorities and be like, Hey, I'm going to do this. Is this going to be an issue for you guys? I did. I went to the lead detective. I told him, I want you to hear it from me before you hear it from anybody else. And this was, um, pro probably only two months into me doing the research for it. Uh, and he looked me in the eye and said, if I was in your position, I would be doing the exact same thing. And wow. I said, got it. L I've got work to do. I got to go. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. That's actually, yeah. I feel like that doesn't always happen where mm -hmm. The authorities don't want that kind of attention oh, oftentimes yeah. on cases they're mm -hmm. working on. Yeah. But that's really cool to hear that he gets it. And I think more law enforcement agencies are starting to understand, like, we've got to embrace social media. We've got to embrace, you know, all these new forms of media and and not look at it as like a negative and, and rather let's utilize it as a positive. I mean, mm -hmm. a lot of agencies use it to connect with the public, you know, trying to rebuild that relationship between the public and police which I think is really cool, but also utilizing it as a tool to drum up new information and tips, I think is, I mean, it's just a no brainer. It just is like, why wouldn't you do that? Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Are they going to participate at all in the podcast or are they kind of, because it's active, they're like, we, there's not much we can say type of thing. Oh, I asked them. Yeah, to, I'm sure you did. <laughs> I, yeah. I asked them. They politely declined, which is fine. Um, but you know, they, they can't really say too much because, it it's still an open active missing person case so mm -hmm. yeah it makes sense so i guess we should dive into yeah you know her who mara was a little bit and you know this is going to be very kind of more conversational overview of the case to kind of give you maybe the the information to then go to media pressure and mm -hmm. get the real inside scoop on everything and and hear from the family. I think that's the most interesting thing about the podcast, especially your father. I, I just was like so drawn in into. I, I love listening. It, to your dad. He he just makes you feel like as a listener. I just kind of felt like, oh, I'm kind of part of the fam. You know, he's like he's got that very <laughs> likable, yeah, um, way of speaking, and he just seems like a amazing guy. So, mm -hmm. so that's kind of the plan for today. Is hopefully we'll leave. You know, we'll give you enough information in case you haven't heard the case and you know, you know, get some additional insight from Julie. But ultimately, once you're done listening to this episode, head over to Media Pressure, make sure you subscribe, follow over there and start from episode one and start working your way through. You'll probably binge it in a day yeah. like we did. So yeah. it's, it's it's that good. So. Really good. Should we dive in?
Yeah. Okay. So I want to talk more about Mora. I want to talk about her background and, you know, who she really was. I think, you know, there's the majority of people out there want to hear that information. Of course, there's people that, you know, they just want to hear the case and blah, blah, blah. But we find it incredibly valuable, especially, you know, as podcasters, but also as listeners um, to really to feel connected. Um, so I wanted to to just kind of hear from you about what she was like growing up. Um, she was born May 4th, 1982 in the small town of Hanson, Massachusetts to your parents, Fred and Lori. Um, you have three older siblings, Fred Jr., Kathleen, and one younger brother, half-brother, Curtis, who did the music for your podcast. That was really cool. Yeah. And it was nice to hear from Fred Jr. too Yeah, in the show. So can you tell us a little bit about growing up, what your family dynamic was like, and maybe some fun stories or memories that you have? Yeah, well, we had a large family, obviously. Um, we didn't have a whole lot of money, but we didn't really know that. We didn't have a lot yeah. of money because we were a very athletic, outdoorsy type of family. So we would always go camping, hiking in the White Mountains of New Hampshire every year, multiple times a year. We were always playing sports. No matter what the season, we would be playing the sport for that season. And so it was fun. I mean, it was fun. Um, we didn't realize that we we didn't have all the bells and whistles that maybe some of the other kids had because we were out in the woods camping, hiking. You know, we loved it. Um, so Mara was two and a half years younger than me, and she was incredibly intelligent. She was in all high honor classes and she scored almost a perfect score on the SATs. Um, super, super smart. And we knew that early on. She just picked things up and we knew because she was so witty and funny that, okay, you know, she's, she's smart, you know, cause she's coming back with comebacks against all her older siblings <laughs> and we're like wait a minute we didn't think of that <laughs> so it, it was cool she was kind of the jokester goofy quirky um kid and then she was an outstanding athlete like i said so she was on the varsity basketball team as a freshman oh wow, wow. yeah she made the u.s nationals in cross country and track finished 33rd in the nation, oh my just God. incredibly gifted. But what made Mara special was she was so humble, even though she was so talented. She was so humble, even with me. You know, I'm the older sister. You'd think that she'd throw it in my face about how smart she was or how she's beating my times at the same age. But no, I mean, she was my number one fan. So that was cool. Um and eventually my parents got divorced and so we didn't see um my dad as much although he became our chauffeur so we would see him probably more than we should have uh because he was picking us up from practice because my mom worked the 3 to 11 shift as a nurse and mm -hmm. then he was always involved with coaching in some capacity so um he was always around and uh that that was good to have such an engaged father after a divorce. Yeah. Yeah. So that was definitely special. And so we were all very close. Um, it was just a lot of fun growing up. Um, it, we came from a really small town. New Englanders will get this, but we only had one Dunkin' Donuts. And that's <laughs> <laughs> that's kind of how you judge how big a town is. is <laughs> that's so funny. <laughs> how many Dunkin' Donuts there are. And so we had one. We have since gained another one. So we're a town Aww. of two Dunks. Um, wow, coming yeah, up in the world. We are. We are they are. full service locations, though? We're not talking. They are. They yeah. are, yes. <laughs> not in a gas station. Give me, <laughs> give me the full credit for that. Yeah. <laughs> that's that's funny. funny. I was telling you earlier, my dad grew up in Massachusetts. And when we moved out to Colorado, he would get it shipped here in boxes. Oh, yeah. 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 Bostonians are very serious about the Dunkin' Donuts. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's good stuff. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, that's kind of Mara in a snapshot. Um, she was goofy, funny, always playing practical jokes, making everybody laugh. Um, just fun to be around. 
So you guys really all had like similar interests and was any of your siblings kind of like the odd one out as far as like they're totally interested in something else like maybe not outdoorsy or is everybody just like camping sounds great let's do it well we all loved camping so that was there but my sister kathleen and freddie in in a way were more the artistic type so kathleen could sculpt anything she could paint anything Mm. and of course i I couldn't do any of that. And <laughs> um, Mara could kind of, um, but Kathleen was definitely more artsy, okay. I would say. But she still played all sports and still loved to camp and hike and be outdoors. We we all did. But the, the, the major commonality within the siblings are that we're all introverted. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. That, that works out well then. You've got your friend group kind of like built in. Did you guys have like mutual friends and things like did you and mara have mutual friends at all oh well our teammates so we're always you know when you're on a long distance cross-country team you bond with each other over many miles and so we we had the same teammates so the same group of friends yep that's Mm. really cool that is so you you know talk about how you know once you left high school you go to West Point, kind of talk us through why you went to West Point and then subsequently how Mara ended up kind of following in your footsteps there. And can you kind of explain what West Point is for people who don't know? Yeah. Um, Well, I knew growing up that my family probably wasn't going to be able to pay for college because we didn't have a lot of money and we had so many kids. So there was one summer where I went to the Coast Guard Academy for a week long, just high school kid program. And I absolutely loved it. I fell in love with it. I loved marching around. I loved doing push ups. I loved wow. all the red. Regi- <laughs> yeah, I, it was Getting weird. Screamed at I loved <laughs> it. I loved it. And so I came back. I remember coming back and like, Dad, I love this. And he's like, Oh, well, that's fully funded (laughs) he's like great (laughs) i kind of love that too (laughs) um so that was my first experience nobody in my family were military um so i really didn't know what i was getting myself into i just thought this summer program for high school kids where they didn't really yeah it was like a watered down version (laughs) definitely and he said well if that's something you love we could we could pursue that and so Right around that time, I started getting recruiting letters for track and cross country. And I was like, oh, man, I could go to college on a scholarship. So I started looking into some of these. And one of the letters came from West Point, the West Point track coach. And I arranged a weekend visit and I went out to West Point and visited and loved it even more than the Coast Guard Academy. And, <laughs> wow. Yeah. And it, it was a little bit more intense, obviously, because uh, it was the real deal, what I saw, but probably a little watered down as well because um, I didn't want to scare everyone away. Uh, and I came back and I, I applied. I also applied to the Naval Academy and I applied for an Army ROTC scholarship at Boston University. Or maybe it was Boston College, but I was hooked. I wanted to be in the military. Um, So I applied and then you have to go through this major process to do the West Point application. You've got to take an aptitude test, a physical, you got to write essays. You've got to get a congressional nomination from a sitting um, senator. So I did all that. It was overwhelming for a high school kid. and then I got my nomination from Senator Ted Kennedy, and wow. I got accepted, and I went. And so to answer your question, it's fully funded. Cadets do not pay. Um, it's one of the best schools in the country, uh, but it comes with a cost. And that cost is you have to be disciplined. You don't get a true college experience. Every minute of every day is programmed. And it's hard emotionally, psychologically, physically. You know, you have to memorize all these different things. You've got to make your bed to a certain standard. You've Mm got to shine shoes. You've got to march around. You've got to learn how to fire a rifle. 
And I just loved it, all of it. <laughs> so I would tell Mara, I said, this is awesome. You're going to love it. I'm meeting all these new people from all over the world. Everyone seems pretty smart. Um, and so I would write home to her and tell her how much I thought she'd enjoy it. And oh, by the way, you get to go to school with me and <laughs> we can run together like we used to. And it's free. And so she got recruiting letters from major top schools, Harvard, Yale, Brown. She didn't apply. She applied to West Point and West Point only. Really? The wow. only school that she applied to. It's like, I'm going to go be with my sister. She's going to go be with her sister. And my dad even tried to convince her to maybe, you know, put some feelers out for some other schools, go on some visits. Nope. Didn't do it. Wow. And so she got her nomination for also from Senator Ted Kennedy and joined me at West Point. Is there, is it easier for a sibling to join another sibling? Like, you know, sometimes they have that like family. Like legacy. Legacy type of thing there. Yeah, it's not, it's it's kind of an unwritten um, thought that it's easier. Of course, Mara had all the credentials. She didn't right. need, no. need me to be there. But it, it, it definitely is easier um, once you ha you're established. Because a lot of my friends had parents or yeah or other siblings that also went to to west point which makes sense because that's kind of the military um kind of thing just for joining the military if you have a, come from a military family i know there's you know connections there and stuff but obviously she was well qualified on her own without the connection to to get get into west point did you because like in my mind i'm thinking this had to have been a shock to the system you know, your first day at West Point, were you guys growing up like pretty organized? Like you guys, did you feel well prepared going to West Point or was it just like a rude awakening for you? I didn't, Mara? I didn't feel well prepared. Um, I, I'm more of a, um, slower thinker. And so memorizing all of the, we call it plebe knowledge. That was hard for me. Um, like learning how to shine shoes, you get it. You you get classmates that had other family members in the military that could show you the ropes. Um, but I don't know. I I just the minute I I step foot into on the grounds the first day, you're just immersed in just this shock to the system. And I was it, it was kind of thrilling to me. Yeah. And so I liked it. Um, but not everybody likes it. I mean, at West Point, the first day, the first week is when you have the, the most um, people drop out. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. Because it, it it's, it's that way by design because if you don't really want to be there, say if you apply and you get in because your parents pushed you to be there, you're not going to withstand with the, the, the yelling and screaming and the push-ups and stuff like that. So Because you have like drill sergeants and stuff too, right? Yeah. And you're like running around marching around carrying all your gear around yeah and all of that yeah that's i mean you can go watch videos on youtube now they they do like a day i've watched all the the military academies and also very random but like the chefs at these schools and just like oh yeah the people that work <laughs> in the kitchen that's always fascinating to me to see how they prepare meals for all these cadets and i'm just like wow and then watching how fast everybody comes it's like everything's a well-oiled machine yeah at these schools this is not like let's go hit the taco bell you know i'm gonna ride my skateboard over here i'm sure you can like can you ride skateboards and stuff like that no no <laughs> <laughs> so you're marching from you're, you're marching yeah well, definitely definitely a different college experience yeah. than we had so did you was there anything you didn't like and you relayed any of that to her or did you just love it so you're like you're gonna love this everything's awesome it's a challenge every day and mara's like yes yeah that's what i want well, I I liked all the stuff at the in the we called it beast barracks. It's the first eight weeks, and it's meant to weed out people that don't really want to be there. It wasn't until I hit the academic year where I was like, "Whoa," um, because I'm I wasn't that great at math, and mm. all it was was like high level math, and yeah, I wow. I really struggled with that. And Mara, I would write home or call my one call a week or whatever it was, ridiculous. Um, and she would help me. She'd say, okay, here's the formula. You need to look at this or whatever. And she would help me as a high schooler. Um, but 
you know, having me at the academy before Mara, I I prepared Mara. I gave her my plea knowledge book and I said, memorize all of this. And so I didn't have that. Um, and I taught her how to make the bed, shine the shoes, wear a uniform, march, salute, the whole nine. So she was prepared. Um, but I, there was nothing that I could say to prepare her for three people surrounding you screaming at you. Right. I cannot even imagine. Yeah. What did you major in? I majored in systems engineering and minored in psychology. Oh, interesting. And Maura did um, chemical engineering? Mm-hmm. Wow. Um, Smart family. <laughs> Very well, impressive. I, I was probably the dumbest, but... <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that's fair to say at all. Okay, so she gets there, and I'm sure you were so pumped to finally have her there. Um, how were her first couple weeks? Not great. <laughs> Not yeah. great. I didn't, I didn't realize that she was going to react the way she did. I thought it was a game. And it was to me, and that's how you get through it. It's just a game. These are just other cadets yelling at you. They've gone through it, and you could see them. Some of them would be like talking on the side, and you could see them like laughing. and And you think, oh, they're real. They're not these these machines. They're actual real, you know, people. Yeah. But they wouldn't show that to you. So I think that got Tamara a bit. And there was one day where I went in to give her cookies in her room, which was a perk to have a sibling at the academy because I could sneak her stuff. She wasn't supposed to have cookies. Um, and she was sobbing, crying. And that's when I realized, oh, this might, this might be too much for her emotionally. Can we talk about the training trip to Fort Knox? Mm-hmm. And kind of what happened there, because that's obviously something that many people bring up. And I'd, I'd love for you to like kind of set the record straight and just explain it in your own words what happened. Right. I'd be happy to. So the second, Mara makes it through the Beast Barracks, which is eight weeks, the hardest time at West Point. And then she made it through the entire first year, academic year. Again, the hardest time because you're, we call them plebes, but you're freshmen and you just are kind of like toys for the upperclassmen to entertain themselves with and make wow. them do dumb, stupid things. Um, so Mara makes it through that. And then the second summer at West Point, you have to go to this eight-week training program. Maybe it's 10 weeks, and it's called Camp Buckner. And it was at Camp Buckner where they take a week-long trip to Fort Knox, and that's where you learn about tanks and other more advanced um, military training. So she's at but Fort Knox, and she goes into the Post Exchange, which is kind of like the Walmart of military bases. It's tax-free. They have everything. And she steals less than $5 worth of makeup. And she was with another friend. Her name is Megan. She's on the podcast. And she, Megan looked at Mara. She was right beside her and said, what? you know, what happened after the incident. And Morris said, I don't know why I did that. And of course, Mara fessed up to it immediately, it took ownership of stealing the makeup. Um, but she, but I still to this day, I don't know why she did that. Mm -hmm. And I, I was at my own training um, that summer. So I didn't see her until the next academic year when we started. Uh, and I asked her, just face to face, why did you do that? And she looked down, embarrassed, and just told me, I don't know. Because she had money. Yeah. To just buy it. Yep. So. Well, aren't you given some type of stipend too? Yeah. Cadets are given a very small amount, but enough to like buy sodas and some food and stuff. Yeah. But she had the money. Did she ever steal prior like even throughout her childhood as like a kid like steal anything or no. is that literally the first time you'd ever heard of her stealing something i mean she may have but not that i was aware sure it was when i learned that i was like whoa what are you doing yeah. it was way out of character especially from the post exchange like right full well knowing the risks involved with that and obviously there's disciplinary action you have to go before a committee and all of that like that's it's a pretty big deal to come into fence like that, especially over something so small. Mm -hmm. Did you kind of get 
the impression at that point that there's something else going on or you know was obviously she was kind of struggling through through school the academy and having a rough time did you feel like that was part of it like maybe she just was kind of just not thinking or going through something like a way out i know you kind of mentioned that yeah uh, it was way out of character for her there was no reason for her to do that i thought it could have been this is just my opinion i get beat up for this all the time but i think it could have been that was her way to have an excuse to leave without outright quitting yeah and what's interesting is i was just in contact with another one of mara's classmates who struggled at west point and also had disordered eating and she told me that was a symptom another indicator of losing control is not only disordered eating but also those little petty theft type things so that may have contributed to it. Mm-hmm. I, I don't know exactly when Mara's eating disorder started, but I'm assuming it was around that time. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we talked a lot about this earlier. I, I really appreciated you guys getting into conversation around, you know, her struggle with eating disorders. It's it's so incredibly common in college, but as you brought up in the in media pressure that it's there's even more pressure mm-hmm. on, you know, athletes and people who are under lots of stress, like Adam Military Academy. And, um, you know, it's something that's not talked about enough. I think it's so incredibly common. I was bulimic around Maura's age too. And, you know, hearing that, like, I've just related to a lot of the things that she was doing kind of like, because you do feel like shameful about it. I know you said you wish she sought help for that. And, you know, it it takes a lot. And sometimes it's not as easy to to seek that help you know and yeah. it's, it's easy to to hide it yeah and it it wasn't easy for me to talk about it because i still have guilt myself for not doing more for her because i knew about it not right then but i eventually learned that she was struggling and my response was stop it yeah and that's it's i hate that i wasn't a, there to support her I beat myself up over that for sure because I didn't understand it. I didn't know what it was. Um, But after talking to so many different people that struggle with it, and I've had tons of people reach out since I talked about it on Media Pressure saying, you know, I went through the same struggles and I beat it or I also did made these stupid decisions. And it's sad, but I think avoiding it isn't giving people the full picture of what she was dealing with so yeah i think it's important um it is it's she was embarrassed she was ashamed and um but it was something that she was struggling with and a lot of my friends at west point especially female were those type a people who also struggled yep yeah that makes a lot of sense and i think it's important for people to to hear that that part of her even though it's not easy but you know you couldn't have how would you have known i mean it's it's such a complicated thing that there wasn't enough especially back then really wasn't any education about it and um if you haven't like experienced it yourself it's it's really hard to wrap your mind around and you could have the same attitude of all right i had family members that were like why are you doing this just yeah just don't do that anymore you yeah. know and it's like so it's so much more complicated than that and it doesn't come from a bad place i think it's just like a lack of understanding. That's why it's it's so great to talk about it. Yeah. Um, Do you feel like the school supported cadets with with issues or you know going through stuff like that? Not as much as they should have. Looking back, of course, hindsight's twenty twenty. Right. But also in two thousand four, there wasn't as much research on eating disorders. And so Mara w- did see a counselor at West Point, the same counselor that the friend I spoke about a couple minutes ago saw. And it was just a joke to them. Mara and this woman talked about it, about how ridiculous it was to sit with this counselor who didn't know anything about eating disorders. Mm. Yeah, wow. That's disappointing. Yeah. yeah. That's, yeah, that definitely doesn't make it any better. Yeah, they, 
really across the board should have more you know mental health support for college students just in in all yeah aspects I mean, yeah. it's it's such a pivotal age where yeah. i think pretty much everyone at some point struggles with with something and college is definitely a time for that to to really come out well and that's what's important to remember we were talking about this earlier too is like this could have been any of us you know to there's some people that like to hone in on the stealing and and some of the mistakes that she made and and try to define her by her mistakes but it's like this could have been any of us like if we all look back especially those of us who've been through college and stuff we can all go back to college and be like or just youth or just yeah just growing up i mean we've all made mistakes i've stolen things before yeah um as a you know, kid yeah not proud of those things but like it you're you know you make dumb decisions and in your adolescence and in, in college and stuff. So it's like, I'd like to meet a person who has never made a mistake. Right. But to <laughs> right? define the individual and attempt to shame or blame them mm -hmm. for what ends up happening to them based on some of the mistakes that they made, I think is just way out of line. And I mean, you're just, you're, you're missing the entire point. I feel because of that incident, she left West Point that contributed to why she left. I okay. believe. Yeah. So this happened the summer before 9-11. So she admitted guilt. And so when cadets admit guilt, then they don't have to go through the full honor board procedures because they said, yep, I did it. And then they just have to determine punishment. So her trial, her honor committee was condensed uh, because she admitted wrongdoing and it was just a matter of punishment. So that was happening. She was missing class. Her grades were dropping. She was having to do this archaic punishment where she had to walk back and forth with a rifle march back and forth for hours. And so that's one of the punishments at West Point. It's called hours walking hours and it zaps you of your time, which as a cadet, you have no time. I talked about earlier how my roommate and I used to set an alarm for six minutes to nap in between classes because, Unreal. <laughs> I mean, we just, we didn't have the luxury to take a real nap. But if we had six minutes, we would do it because we were exhausted. Um, so Mara's walking these hours. She's missing track practice. She's, she, she's missing class and catching up on homework and things like that. Then 9-11 happens. And she's in this process of um, going through this honor board punishment. And I think that contributed to her to why she wanted to leave as well. Because at the end, towards the end of the, your second year as a cadet, you have to take the oath of affirmation, which locks you into five years active duty military service. And at that time, we were absolutely going to be um, shipped over to Iraq or Afghanistan. It was guaranteed um, because everybody was. And those deployments were going to be over a year long. And so when you're a 20, 21 year old and you're thinking a year long, that's an eternity yeah. for someone. So she opted not to take the oath of affirmation and she um, never received her punishment and she opted to transfer to UMass. So to answer the question, I think there was multiple factors involved with that. She wasn't happy at West Point. She didn't want to go to war. Nobody did. I didn't, that wasn't my plan to go to war. I thought I was just going to get this great education and then go on, maybe go to law school or something. Mm. Nope, didn't happen. But I had already taken the oath, so I was locked in. If you take the oath and then decide to drop out, then you have to pay back your time. Okay, I was wondering oh, about that. So you do have to pay it back if you exit you, early. If you exit early, you pay it back or you have to join the regular army as an enlisted soldier and pay back your time that way. Oh, wow. Which Yeah, you don't want to do. You that. don't want to do that. So, she was already and she was struggling with this eating disorder. She wasn't happy, so she decided to leave. And, and, and people say she was kicked out. That is verifiably false. She was not. Yeah, that's been widely misreported. Yeah. I was under that impression for a while. But then you can take all your credits and transfer them like an 
any other university and go to another school to yeah. finish your degree. Yes, and that's what Mara did. So do you think that decision for her was good, that it was a good move for her to go to UMass? I thought it was a great decision for her to get out. Was she, I didn't want I didn't want to go to Iraq, but I knew I was going or somewhere. Yeah. And I obviously didn't want my sister to be yeah. in harm's way either. Right. And I knew she wasn't happy. I knew she didn't like it. Mm-hmm. And she was struggling. She had mental health issues and she, that wasn't a good place for her yeah. for so many reasons. Yeah. How did she do with her first semester at UMass? Uh, Dean's list. Like turned it around. Incredible. Yeah. Yeah. She yeah. kind of felt like the weight of the academy lifted off her where she could really thrive. And obviously a lot of her freedom freedoms came back. So Yeah. But she also wasn't in the clear. I mean, you don't just stop West Point and now you don't have an eating disorder anymore. Right. She was definitely still struggling with that. And so she made more poor decisions that I, I I'm not I'm not minimizing Mara's decisions. What she did was wrong. Let me be clear. But you also have to factor in the stressors that she was under and this mental health issue that she didn't have control over. Going back a little bit, while she was at West Point, she met Billy Roush. Roush. I always say his name wrong. But they continued to date even after West Point. Yes. Even though he was now stationed at Fort Sill at that point Mm -hmm. in Oklahoma. Right. Okay. So And they had broken up before but they were trying to make the long distance thing work were things like pretty rocky between them yeah yeah they they would break up get back together break up get back together okay that they did the the whole do loop you know typical of kids that age college kids that age of course i told mara directly to leave him because i found out that he had cheated on her and she can try to make it work anyway. Mm-hmm. Did she ever express like long term plans with him? Like, did she ultimately want to marry him and kind of settle down, that sort of thing? Yeah, they had talked about Mara getting a nursing job because nursing jobs are very um, transferable. So it made sense in her mind, I think, that if she was a nurse and Bill got stationed somewhere else. That's probably the one of the best careers you could have because you can work at a hospital and they're everywhere. So they did talk about that. Um, and there was talk about being engaged. That they were not engaged. Um, but I do believe that they discussed it. Okay. What, what did your dad think of Bill? My dad thought that Bill, well... He described him as a used car salesman. Bill was like to talk a lot. So Bill was a talker and I didn't particularly um, like that. And he knew it and everybody else knew it because I told them (laughs) to include Mara. Um, But my dad didn't have any reason to not like Bill. He didn't give us any reason. I mean, he gave me enough reason not to like him because I didn't think Mara deserved a guy that was going to cheat on her when you're out of school that's 85 percent outstanding most outstanding top-notch candidates to yeah. date yeah. so there's other fish in the pond was mm-hmm. my thought process yeah of course you always want best for your sister right yeah so then going forward a little bit here um Maura did find herself in a little bit more trouble in fall of 2003 um, in no- that November, she had food delivered to her dorm six times using a credit card number, and it turns out that that credit card didn't belong to her. Can you kind of explain that situation as well? Right. She used somebody else's, stole somebody else's credit card uh, to order large quantities of food late at night, which is just so typical of someone yeah. struggling yeah. to not only order food late at night, to kind of mask the shame of it all, but also the quantities in which she was ordering was way more than one person. Mm-hmm. If you add up the total charges, it was still relatively low. It's not like she was stealing hundreds of dollars, but it was wrong and she got caught doing that. And then she was put on three months probation 
But I think it's important to note that when she was confronted about doing this, she, like she had in the past, she totally um, owned it. Mm-hmm. She admitted it. She always did. Um, yeah, it says a lot. Yeah. Yeah, she could have denied it and said, I don't know. Right. It does count for something. Yeah, it it, it does. Um, and I actually, this was interesting. I got a message from the woman whose credit card she used. Really? Yeah, and she follows the case, and she was very, very kind. And she told me that she didn't want to file a police report, but in order to get the the amount that was used back, uh-huh. she was forced to file the police report. So she had some sort of guilt for doing that because mm-hmm. she was thinking, as we all have gone through this, where we blame ourselves, and she's saying, well, if I didn't, do this maybe she wouldn't have gotten in the trouble and i i was just like no you you did what you were supposed to do yeah. but it was just nice to hear to hear from her yeah i'm sure mm-hmm. probably been nice to connect with a lot of the the people over the years who you know had some part of this in some way yeah, yeah it seems like you've been able to connect with quite a few people yeah um and she turned herself into the police is that correct? Well, the police showed up at her dorm room, which is kind of odd that it, was, it people say it was like a sting operation for like mm-hmm. a pizza. Um, <laughs> yeah, what? I've never heard of that before. Yeah, the police showed up and knocked on her door. I don't know if they were dressed as the delivery person or what, but she answered the door and the police, you know, said, what are you doing? This isn't your card. And she owned up to it. Yeah. So did you ever talk to Mara about that whole incident? No, No. I didn't. I wasn't aware of it. Okay. When did you become aware of it? Not until after she disappeared. Okay. And Mara hated to disappoint me as an older sister. And I was, I was by the rules. I, you know, like to follow the rules. I like structure so she she would probably would know that I would have said, what the hell are you doing? Why did you do that? Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. Well, it seems like she really never wanted to disappoint any of your family, but re- she really looked up to you and yeah. didn't want to let you down in any way. Yeah, she did. Which, of course, you know, I think you would have been understanding and yeah, obviously you want the best for her, but I, I totally get that. I know, you know, I have a little sister too and I know that she wouldn't, want to you know disappoint me in any way yeah so it's an interesting dynamic but okay so let's let's fast forward here and talk about her disappearance and um, there's a lot to go over here so i want to make sure we get through as much as we can um so that brings us to february 5th thursday and friday february 6th 6th 2004 Um, Mara had finished the fall semester and went back to school after winter break. On Thursday, February 5th, she was scheduled for a late night shift at the security desk at Melville Hall, which was near the building, her building, Kennedy Hall. Now, was that um, something she volunteered to do or was it kind of like an RA type thing where you're you get like credit towards school or was it just a paid job? It, It was described to me as a job where she yes, she got paid, but she could also do her schoolwork on the job. Yeah. And so okay. for for somebody like Mara, who, you know, her schoolwork was important to her, like I said before, she was on the dean's list, a job where you could do your homework kind of is like killing two birds with one stone and get paid for it. So what, how long would these shifts be and how late would she end up working? They varied based on the day because UMass had, different hours where these shift workers um worked and uh, this shift would would take her to 1 a.m wow i believe i i believe yeah okay so the first several hours of that shift were pretty uneventful just taking a few calls on her personal cell phone and then at 12 40 a.m right before her shift is supposed to end uh she took a call on the security desk phone And what we know about this mysterious call is uh, UMass police detective Brian Davies told the, uh, is it Caledonian record? Yes. Yes. 
um, in an article that was printed on February 27th, 2004, that his department um, was actually able to track the phone call saying, quote, we know the location. We have not been able to identify whom she was speaking with. Um, and that maybe indicates that the phone call was upsetting, um, most likely from the dorm line. That's what I believe. So let me let me back up and give a little bit of more clarity here. So M Mara was at the desk. She takes a call from my sister at 1010. She talks to my sister Kathleen for 28 minutes. And after the disappearance, Kathleen said there wasn't, Mara didn't seem upset. Kathleen did share that she had relapsed. So Kathleen had issues with alcohol and she had been to a rehab center and her fiance got her from the rehab center and took her directly to a liquor store. Unbelievable. I don't need to say any more about that. Um, that probably would have upset Mara, but not to the degree to which she was unresponsive later on in the night. Then we know that she took another call about 12 midnight, six minutes past midnight from her boyfriend, Bill. Um, and I've asked Bill and he said nothing about that call stood out to him. And Mara did not seem upset. And then shortly before 1 a.m. is when Mara's supervisor was notified that Mara, something was wrong with Mara and she was unresponsive at the desk job at Melville Hall. And so she wasn't actively doing her job because she was upset. So she wasn't checking people in. People were just coming and going. So we've always been trying to identify the source of what made her so upset. Yeah. And so in talking to my sister Kathleen and in what Bill says, it doesn't seem like either of those two calls, Mara was upset. So I'm not sure about the 1240 timestamp about when the dorm phone call happened, but we do know that there was a dorm phone there and Mara probably took a call from somebody else and that ha may have been what caused her to be so upset but to this day we still don't know who it was and like you said in the caledonian record article the umass police identified the lo location of that call but not who it was so that's still a big question mark what made her so upset to where she wasn't able to respond the thursday before she went missing and I, I still can't answer that. Yeah, and you don't have like any theory or any certain, you know, belief of what it could have been or who it was. Well, what I what I've thought about is if Mara was talking to another guy, she wouldn't have done so on her cell phone because the cell phone was a shared family plan with her boyfriend Bill, so Bill would have been able to see those calls okay. and. Mara was smart enough not to do that. So maybe, this is just my opinion, maybe she talked to another guy and something about that call on the dorm line made her upset. But we do know when her supervisor showed up, all Mara could say was, my sister, my sister. So that makes it seem like it had something to do with the earlier call with yeah. Kathleen or something was said in the later call pertaining to me but i don't know what that would be mm. i have some ideas but do you think it's possible that she was actually upset about something else but said my sister my sister because she didn't want to explain it to whoever was asking i think that's very possible yeah yeah that's kind of what i was thinking too because she was really upset she was described as sobbing uncontrollably um yeah almost like in a She's been described as being almost in a trance like state, like something traumatic had happened. Yeah. Um, and of course, people have all types of theories about what it could have been. And I think that's what's so hard not knowing what that call actually was or who it was from, because that leaves so much room for speculation and for people to come up with all these. I mean, I've heard so many wild theories and right. some of them don't really make any sense. Um, that must be so frustrating for you to not have an answer like that which could be such a huge piece of the puzzle yeah it, it could be huge because i've i've never seen mara like that yeah and so whatever it was that upset her was big and now she's missing she's gone and 
we don't know what that was and no one's come forward. And Kathleen said, you know, we did have this difficult discussion. Obviously, it's it was a upsetting topic, but she doesn't think it would have made her upset to that degree. Right. And that many hours later. Yeah. So Kathleen ended her call with Mara at 1030. This emotional breakdown didn't happen to close to 1 a.m. Yeah. So it's really, really strange. Yeah. Was there any other, like you alluded to, maybe it was a guy, another guy she talked to. So is there, do we have any confirmation that she was romantically involved with any other guys at this time? Like, was there other guys she was seeing on the side? Because I think that's a big point of contention for a lot besides, of people. Besides, um, besides, yeah, besides dating Bill Roush. Yeah. Because. Well, and the track coach, I'm forgetting. Yeah. Um, uh, Bag daddy, yeah. Bag daddy, yeah. Yeah. So during one of Mara's breakups with Bill, she, and this isn't a hundred percent confirmed, but it's been said that she had a romantic relationship with the assistant track coach, who was a grad assistant. So people have kind of made him seem like this older guy, but he was a twenty-two, maybe maybe twenty-three-year-old graduate assistant, not married. Oh, interesting. That's definitely misreported. I didn't understand. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. And he was actually going to parties with the college kids because he was basically just out of college himself. Right. Um, So he's at parties, whether he was supposed to be or not, I don't know. Um, But he was definitely there. And I have pictures of him there with with Mara. Um, So I definitely can confirm that he was partying with the college kids to include Mara. Um, So... There's this romantic relationship that she had with him um, during one of the breakups. I know Bill Bill has said that he was, when during their breakups, he was with other women as well. So mm. they were definitely not exclusive in that way. So she could have been pursuing someone or someone was pursuing her. I don't know who it is, though, who it was. And again, why would that make her so upset to this point that she's unresponsive that is very weird yeah it is very weird but i like to remind people we're talking about a 21 year old true true woman yeah who could easily i got upset about so so many things that are so insignificant now that i have all these years to look back on like why was i so upset over this one incident or this one issue with this guy back when i was 21 it meant nothing totally but when it's magnified by your how naive you are at that age, um, it could have caused her to be upset. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So, do you think there's a possibility maybe we're reading too much into that, and that is completely unrelated to her disappearance, or do you really feel that this is kind of that trigger moment that kind of starts everything off? Oh, I think it's important. I think it's very important. Um, I think whatever that was had some sort of role in her decision to leave UMass on Monday when she disappeared. But the problem is looking at Mara's case, every single thing that we're talking about could be as insignificant as it is important, but we just don't know. Yeah. So that's why I think it's important to not completely rule anything out and Mm -hmm. keep everything on the table I disagree with my dad in in many ways in terms of his initial focus was, you know, what happened in New Hampshire. I've always thought that what happened at UMass is important. It plays into. And he's come around to that idea. Yeah. Sure. (laughs) With a lot of (laughs) convincing. Yeah. (laughs) It makes sense because I think a lot of it goes back to her mind state and where she was at. Yeah. Because her actions are clearly affected by the way that she's feeling internally and what she's dealing with. Because otherwise, if you discount that completely, it makes absolutely no sense whatsoever right? as to why she'd end up where she does. Yeah, that's, hmm. so that's, getting that's a great way to look at it. Back to the timeline a little bit. Um, so after she is having this emotional episode, um, Karen tells Mora that she can go home early. She walks her back to her dorm at Kennedy Hall, and she even offered to come up and talk to her. Mara said, you know, I, I'll be okay. I have a roommate that she was home. 
Um, but this was a lie and she actually lived alone. Um, do you think she just wanted the space and so just like told her whatever in that moment so she could be alone? That's what I would have done. Yeah. As an introvert dealing with Dang. some sort of emotions, the last thing I want to do is sit and chat with somebody. I want to be alone. I think Mara was trying to unburden Karen by not and being polite. Mara, I, I believe Mara's response was a polite way to tell Karen that she needs some alone time. Yeah. Yeah. Well, as far as anyone knows, she went to bed without talking to anyone else. And then that Friday, February 6th, was a normal day for her. It was pretty uneventful based on her phone records. We do know that school was canceled that day because UMass got hit with a snowstorm. Right. Okay. So then jumping forward to Saturday, February 7th, um, early that morning, your dad came and picked her up to go car shopping. So what was going on with her car? Mara had my dad's old 1996 Saturn. And after Christmas, between this weekend and after sometime in Christmas, Mara took a trip down to visit my dad in Bridgeport, Connecticut, where he was working a travel job as a nuclear med um, tech. And while she was driving from UMass, the car started bucking a little bit and then it started smoking. Mm. And so she gets to Bridgeport and she says, Dad, there's something wrong with the Saturn. It's not acting right. And so my dad takes it to a local mechanic down there in Connecticut and has him look at it. He tells my dad that it blew a cylinder or it's down a cylinder. I don't know the technical term, um, but it seemed like a pretty big job. And he didn't think that he could fit it in in the time that Mara was at Connecticut, was in Connecticut. So my dad said, okay, don't worry about it. We are going to get you a new car anyway because you need a re you need a car that's reliable as a prerequisite for the nursing program. She had to have a reliable car. Mm -hmm. At that point, she, um, she had been carpooling. Um, so he, my dad decided, I'm not going to dump a bunch of money into getting this Saturn fix that's not a reliable, yeah. not a good not a good investment mm -hmm. at that point and he did not want her to drive that car so he drove it himself back to UMass while Mara followed him in his new Corolla and he put it in the back parking lot at UMass and told her you do not drive this car we're, we're gonna get you a new one that's not safe so that just illustrates how serious it was that my dad would drive it himself all the way back up to UMass. He did not want Mara driving that car. Yeah. Otherwise, he would have just put her back on the road, but he knew it wasn't safe. Okay, so then that day they go car shopping and they're out like all afternoon. Right. And then um, Fred takes Mara and her friend Kate, who was, she was friends with from the track team. Yeah. And they all go out to dinner um, and neither of them mentioned the car shopping in front of Kate. Was there a specific reason for that or? I don't know if that's, I don't know if, I what? don't know about that. Yeah. yeah. Why wouldn't they? Like, yeah. why is that I a big deal? Really even to, matter. It yeah. seems but, odd. Something that people kind of get. Yeah, it does seem odd. But the fact that my dad drove up there to go car shopping has been something that's been discussed so yeah. many times. Ad nauseum, yeah. Um, but there. There is evidence that he was up there. I have a picture of one of the places that they went to from that day. Uh, and there's a phone call to Reliance Auto that Mara made, clearly looking for autos. Mm -hmm. uh, and then she called me at 321, and she told me about one of the cars she liked. Um, but before my dad showed up at UMass, he the week prior, he went to several different ATMs, or maybe it was the same ATM and withdrew the maximum amount. So he withdrew $500 because he wanted to have some sort of bargaining power when he went to mm -hmm. UMass. Um, and so he ended up having $4,000. It's been said online that he withdrew $4,000 the day of, which defeats the purpose of going to multiple different ATMs because he was, in fact, just pulling out the maximum amount. And that's something I asked my dad about. I said, Dad, why didn't you just write a check? But he said his checkbook was back in 
eastern Massachusetts, so he didn't have it. But come to find out, he would have had to write a check anyway. Mm. Okay. So then after dinner, um, Fred takes the girls to the liquor store uh, to buy alcohol for another friend's party. And this has been like a weird point of contention. People get confused on this about him taking her, but she was 21 years old and could just buy the alcohol herself. Mm -hmm. um, after buying the alcohol, Fred drove back to the hotel he was staying at and that then let Mara drive his brand new Toyota Corolla to this party. Um, obviously, because he didn't want her driving her car. Which, and let's define party. Yeah, this is uh, an right? interesting... Because I think in our heads, we're like rage in college, yeah. you know, house party or something, but that wasn't necessarily the case. Yeah, it it's it was described as a party initially, but as we talked to different people, we found out that it was inside a dorm room in, in the dorm. So it was a small dorm room that could only fit certain a certain amount of people so there was no more than eight to ten people in this small tiny dorm room it's like a dorm hangout a more dorm than anything hangout. yeah no okay. there's not like loud music and strobe lights going and craziness so this was out of friend's dorm and her name is sarah yes um i know you talked about her a little bit on the podcast which was interesting to hear because i had never really heard these details were the two of them how did the two of them know each other Mara and Sarah knew each other from working together at Mara's second job, which was working at an art gallery. Oh, that's yeah. cool. Okay, so the strange thing about, and I don't know if you want to get into all of this. You do go into it on media pressure, but we don't have to get into it here. But you've said that like Sarah's, you haven't really gotten a lot of information from Sarah, that she hasn't been really forthcoming about that night and that there's a lot of you know, questions that you have that you've never been able to get answers to. Um, is that, I'm imagining that's frustrating for you. Yeah. Yeah. So we still don't know a lot. We know close to nothing from Sarah. She told my dad in the one time that she spoke to my family, she told my dad she was asleep the entire time and it was her dorm room. And ever, ever since then, she's never responded to any of my messages or phone calls. Do you find that to be weird? Yes. Yeah, I would. I would be really frustrated with that, and that's that really stands out to me as strange. Obviously, I don't want to make any accusations, or you know, she could have just been asleep, and own, maybe she's just like, I don't. It's just hard not to involved, imagine but. that you could you could sleep in a dorm room party. I mean, it's a, like what isn't it? Aren't the beds in the room? Yeah. So I don't. That all very confusing it's very confusing and she's the host remember? yeah she's the host of this so ga she gathering. invites everyone over for a party and okay. then goes to sleep with them all in the room that just yeah, yeah lots of questions there that's really that's really frustrating feel like i hope maybe she'll her... come forward with more information one and, day. and maybe she has i don't know what she's told law enforcement that's true that is true maybe she just doesn't want to speak about it publicly yeah, and in her reason. in her defense, once you speak about my sister's case publicly, then you become a target for incessant harassment. Yeah, and that's understandable. Yeah, have you? Mm. How many times have you tried reaching out to her over the years? Too many to count. Yeah, and you just never get responses. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe maybe one day she'll feel comfortable enough to yeah. to at least have a conversation. And. I'd be happy if she if she told law enforcement everything. That's all I want. She doesn't need to tell me or anybody else anything. As long as she told the authorities whatever she knew or that she didn't know anything. Hmm. That's all that we want. Just if acknowledgement. That, yeah, if she yeah. doesn't want to come out publicly or even privately and talk to me, I get it. I understand. Mm -hmm. But it's just odd. It is odd. Kate, on the other hand, though, has always been really forthcoming with what she remembers. She tried to help your family as much as she can. Um, what what has she told you guys about what she remembers about the party? Well, she she confirmed that it was a small room in Southwest and couldn't hold a lot of people. She says on the podcast, Media Pressure, she says she didn't have any bad feelings at the party. She didn't notice anybody pairing off with anybody else. And it was really just an average event for her. And nothing really s stood out. Does she remember Sarah sleeping during it? She doesn't remember that specifically. Hmm. 
Interesting. I assume they were having some drinks and, yeah, you know. Typical college. Out. Yeah. yeah. College yeah. chill fest. Okay, so she likely left around 2.33 ish in the morning uh, to return your dad's car to the motel. Um, Kate tried to get her to stay and return the car in the morning, knowing that she had been drinking, but she did insist on leaving. Is that all correct? Yeah. So around 3.30 a.m., Mara ends up running into a guardrail and totaling the car. And an officer came to the scene, wrote an accident report, um, but there's no record of a sobriety test being taken, and Mara didn't get any into any trouble for the wreck. But you mentioned that this was a cadet. Has that confirmed that it was the actual? Was it an actual police officer? Was it like a cadet, or did the cadet just radio or call in the police officer? Mara left her cell phone at the dorm, so Mara didn't have any communication. So we believe that the cadet is the one that called police. What we don't know is whether this cadet, who was also a student, mm -hmm. uh, was with Mara. Was he, he or she at the party? Or did they just happen upon the accident? That mm -hmm. I can't answer. At, okay. Yeah, 3.30 in the morning, I definitely would want to know. Right. Like, yeah. why is this random dude just happened to be there? Yeah, it's it's very confusing. So what was the extent of the damage to the car? Uh, significant. Really bad. Really bad. Yeah, so it was totaled. And, and this was your dad's brand new car. <laughs> brand new car. I'm sure, he's like, dang. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Big dang. Um, but he was, uh, you know, really, he didn't get angry at her for it. It sounds like he was pretty understanding, told her that the insurance company is going to take care of it. The car was towed. She ends up getting a ride back to the motel. Um, and, and told your dad the, the next morning because he was asleep when she got back. But um, yeah, it, that that whole night is is pretty confusing. It, it's I imagine it's still confusing to you to this day. Yeah. Yeah. Do and we, one, one thing I want to add is we so Sarah. So Kate says that they left about the same time. That was about two to two thirty. Mara doesn't get into this wreck until 3.30. Mm -hmm. So there's some missing time. Yeah. And so what did she do in that time? Mm. Did she go back to her room? Did she go somewhere else? We don't know. We know that the crash happened in the direction of where my dad's motel was. But was she actually going to his motel? Because it, it makes no sense for her to go back to the motel. Was she planning to go somewhere else? Was this cadet with her? It's all just very mysterious. Yeah. Yeah. I'm curious because this car was so new, I assume. Was this a new vehicle with like zero miles? Was it a used vehicle that had some mileage to it? Because I'm curious if Fred ever looked at the mileage from when or ever noticed like what the mileage was when he gave it to Mara and then after that accident to look at the mileage. I know sure, that's like really, it, like, who really, yeah. No, <laughs> I'm just saying like that would be interesting to know what the mileage would be. Yeah, my dad would never pay attention to that. He, that was, no, he wouldn't know that. Okay. <laughs> I wish he did. I wish he kept a log. Right, I know. <laughs> no, yeah. he, he didn't. But it was a new car, and he had driven it around. He had driven it, obviously, up to UMass a couple times. Um, but pretty low mileage. It's pretty new. Okay. And to clarify, I kind of like jumped past this, but I do want to make it clear that Mara ended up sleeping in Fred's room that night, even though he didn't even realize that she had come in until the next morning. Um, and he claimed he didn't let her into the room and she didn't have a key to the room. So that's been all very confusing. There's some theories that maybe she slept a while in the lobby before the front desk would actually let her in. But in this case, your dad probably would have been woken up before someone was just let into his room. If like the hotel staff wouldn't just give her this key unless it was like specified beforehand can you make sense of any of this or are you yeah. still confused too well no i I've, I've been able to confirm that she did sleep in the lobby mm -hmm. for a little so she gets a ride back in the tow truck gets dropped off at the motel and does sleep in the lobby and trying to gain access to the room i don't know if she went and knocked on the door i don't know if it was like an on-call situation at the front desk. I don't think it was manned 
it was just kind of like a a just a junky motel. Right, right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I don't know if she had to cut, like ring a buzzer or call a number or I don't know how she got in touch with somebody to let her in. And I'm not sure exactly how if that person gave her a key or let her in or if her name was on the room. Mm. Um, but she gets in and we know that's the first time she had access to a cell phone. So then she calls Bill um, and is crying. And, you know, she was really upset that she crashed my dad's car. Um, do I think she told my dad about that accident right when she got into the room? Absolutely not. <laughs> I wouldn't have either. Yeah, um, so same. She, she, middle of the night, wake him up with that information. Yeah, not great. So she, he didn't, she didn't tell him until later on in the morning. Okay. And then this call that she made to Bill was at 4.49 a.m. Yep. And and he answered. Uh-huh. Hmm. So I have to ask, because I know there's people out there that are wondering, we don't know what was the cause of the accident. Well, we know that the police report says driver inattentiveness and that she slid on some debris in the road. That's what's notated in the report? Yes. Hmm. Okay. Interesting. So it was a because it's notated that way, I assume they did not suspect DUI or anything like that then. If they did, they didn't give they her didn't a, pursue the testing for that. No, they didn't give her any medical treatment and they did not administer sobriety testing. So mm-hmm. a lot of people have said Mara got her second DUI. She got zero DUIs because she didn't get cited for the first accident on Saturday. And she was missing after the second accident on Monday. So zero DUIs. If she had been given a field sobriety test, would she have passed? I don't know. Maybe. Right. right. Maybe. It is interesting, though. She got into an accident to the point where the vehicle is reported as totaled. I would I would assume an officer, if he is arriving to a scene of an accident, the vehicle appears totaled that they would at least get paramedics to come out and check her out. Just make sure she doesn't have any injuries before they just like, all right, tow the vehicle, you know, hop in the tow truck and just leave the scene. Yeah. I, I find that all very odd. And I'm sure you do too. Yeah. That there's just kind of, this is all kind of like wrapped up very quickly. I feel like for this type of scene. Yeah. I don't know. And I've said many times, I wish she got a DUI on Saturday because chances are she'd still be here today. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah, that's a great point. Yeah, that's just very odd. And maybe that's just kind of how they operate. I don't know. But that's definitely a question for me. As many of you guys know, we have a couple cats at home and we absolutely love them. We want to make sure they have the best possible care and food that we can provide. And thanks to our sponsor, Smalls, they cannot get enough of this cat food. They are pretty picky cats, so sometimes, you know, they're not always into the cat food, but they literally fight over who gets first dibs at Smalls. Smalls cat food is protein packed, made with preservative free ingredients you'd find in your fridge, and it's delivered right to your door, which I love. No go into the store, it just shows up in a box, throw it in the fridge, and you're good to go. If you're not familiar with Smalls, Smalls was started back in 2017 by a couple of guys home cooking cat food in small batches for their friends. A few short years later, they served millions of meals to cats around the world. After making the switch to Smalls, 90% of cat owners reported overall health improvements, which is a huge deal. The team at Smalls is so confident your cat will love their product that you can try it risk-free. That means they'll refund you if your cat won't eat their food. So you really have nothing to lose to give Smalls a try. Plus in my Smalls box, they sent me some catnip woven toys, which they absolutely love. I just love the whole brand itself and the food always comes packed perfectly no leakage it doesn't smell weird it's not disgusting to open it's not slimy or any of that it really does look like good quality food and my cats absolutely enjoy it it's 2024 are you still feeding your cat kibble head to smalls.com slash mile higher and use promo code mile higher at checkout for 50 percent off your first order plus free shipping that's the best offer you'll find but you have to use our code mile higher for 50 percent off your first order one last time, that's promo code MileHire for 50% off your first order plus free shipping. So Bill says that on the call with her that night, she's obviously very shaken up, upset over wrecking the car. However, he 
calms her down and tells her he will call back later to check on her. Um, and then your dad wakes up and she tells him about the accident. And what was his reaction? He was shocked. He could not understand why, how she could have done that much damage to the car. Uh, like we said, it was a lot of damage. The car was totaled. But he was relieved that she wasn't hurt. Mm -hmm. And he said that there was not a scratch on her face. So his next thought was, how am I going to get back to my job in Connecticut? Because now I don't have a car. At that point, I don't think he knew that insurance would cover it. Um, of course, he was upset. His car just got banged up. But Mara was, was crying mm -hmm. and distraught because she was her own worst critic. And he knew that there was nothing that he could say to her at that time that would have been harsher than what she told herself. Mm -hmm. And my dad wasn't the type to yell at us. He never, yeah. he never yelled at me, ever. So it's been reported that he, he tells her that insurance is probably going to cover it all to kind of comfort her. Is that true? He told her that when he found out that they were going to cover it. And oh, he'd okay. be out $500. Yep. That was okay. deductible, yeah. Yeah, and then his next focus was, okay, I need to figure out a way to get this car in the shop or to wherever it needs to go and get a rental to get back to his job in Connecticut. Okay, so he ends up getting the rental, and then he takes Mara back to her dorm and watches her walk inside um, after he, right before he drives home. Right. Um, then later that night, your dad and Mara talk on the phone and he tells her that he needs copies of the accident report so that he could give it to the insurance company. She agrees, says that she's going to get them to him. And then um, they had planned again, planned to talk again on Monday night. Right. Okay. So that brings us to Monday, February 9th, 2004. Just after midnight on the 9th, Mara searched online for directions between Amherst, Massachusetts and Burlington, Vermont on MapQuest. We were just kind of laughing at that over breakfast just because, wow, times have really changed. I remember the days of MapQuest. I mean, I'm a little younger, but I, I even still used yeah. MapQuest back in the day. Otherwise, it was get your map out. Yeah. <laughs> your map book. I yeah. remember my parents had like the big map books and we'd be oh, on like yeah. road trips and they're like yep. mm -hmm. turning pages. I'm like, I don't even know how you... Yeah. You're doing this right now. Now, at the time, MapQuest was like revolutionary. Yeah. Yep. So that morning, Billy calls Mara several times and left multiple emails for her as well because they did plan to check back in on each other later. So he was kind of confused about why he can't get a hold of her. And that afternoon, she emails him saying she got the messages and would call him back later. The email specifically said, I love you more, stud. I got your messages. But honestly, I didn't feel like talking to much of anyone. I promised to call today, though. Love you, Mara. Billy didn't answer this email, um, but he kept trying to call her, and she just didn't pick up. Does it? And does that make sense to you? Like she just really wanted space, or but do you think she was possibly angry at him for some reason? Well, it's clear that they were both avoiding, or she was avoiding people and him in general because you can tell from the phone records that there's a missed call and then there's a check of the voicemail so you know how when someone calls and you don't want to answer but you immediately check the voicemail to make sure it's nothing serious yeah that's kind of what i gather from looking at the cell phone records and back then to remind especially some of you who are younger you had to actually call your voicemail to hear the voicemails right um so at 12.55, she had a three-minute call with the owner of a condo in Bartlett, New Hampshire. Now, your family spent a lot of time in Bartlett. Can you kind of explain your experiences there? Yeah, Bartlett was a place right outside. Well, it's in the White Mountains, and it's one of the places we stayed, especially if we went um, during non-summer months. Mm. And even when we went in the summer, we, we would spend some time in Bartlett. But we had stayed at this condo. Um, rental area people rent out their condos it was called the seasons and we'd stay there before so this is the place that mar called to inquire about reservations but she doesn't book a reservation okay so do you think maybe she wanted to go somewhere familiar to her that's kind of comforting and and sort of clear her mind clearly she had a lot going on i think so however when you look at her 
earlier map quest directions they're to a completely different location so she's looking up burlington vermont and mm-hmm. then calling a condo owner in bartlett new hampshire right two Very different confusing. places two two hours away they're well, not they're not close to each other so it seems like she didn't really have a plan mm-hmm. she's kind of contemplating her options yeah. of, of what to do but knew she needed some space and to kind of clear her mind maybe that that's a possible that's mm-hmm. i mean why else would she go there yeah mm-hmm. does burlington vermont like ring a bell for you like is why she'd want to go there we hadn't spend much time in burlington most of our time was spent in the white mountains we had been to burlington before but it only a handful of times so it's not like we had familiar locations or memories up in vermont no but she had been there before yes so okay sorry did you guys spend a lot of time skiing growing up or was she interested in skiing we she could ski but it was cost prohibitive for my yeah. family with all those kids so we yeah. didn't we didn't ski okay yeah so at 1 13 p.m she calls a classmate who she had borrowed clothes from at some point and she wanted to return them does this stand out to you as strange at all that she she made that a priority to return them or was she just that kind of person who you know wanted to make sure she followed through for yeah people that had helped her that tracks with mara being conscientious i could see her wanting to return those clothes mm-hmm. okay so then 1 24 p.m mara emails her nursing school supervisor and told her that she had a death in the family and would be gone for the next week um, but she would let them know when she got back now there wasn't actually a death in the family correct right can you make sense of this at all? Or do you have any kind of take on that? What I think is it was an excuse for Mara as a college kid to get out of class. Makes total sense. Yeah. I mean, I know tons of people that would do that because they are so strict about attendance and stuff. And that's one of the few things that they will, you know, allow time for. Yeah. Of course. Um so, but no one knows exactly why she emailed this to her supervisor and said that she was going to be gone for an entire week. That's kind of confusing. Yeah, it's confusing. So then at 2.05, Mara called 1-800-GO-STO, which is the tourist number for Stowe, Vermont. And the line was down, so she could only listen to you know the pre-recorded information they had about booking a hotel, weather conditions, and ski conditions. Um, and so we believe that she did listen to that most likely uh at 2 18 p.m she finally calls billy back and he didn't answer this time so she left a voicemail and said they would talk soon when she called billy was actually on the phone with kate trying to figure out what was going on with mara and correct me if i'm wrong on this but we've seen it reported that according to friends billy could be controlling and possessive with mara and he would check up on her sometimes when she was out with friends so this wasn't like totally unusual that he called Kate. I I don't know. I'd have to go look at the phone records. I'm not sure if I can confirm that he was on the phone with Kate. It could that could very well be true, but okay. I, I don't I'd ha- I don't want to say that without checking. Okay, so that hasn't been confirmed, but it's been reported that it has. Well, I can confirm it very easily. Um I just I I before I speak I want to make sure that it Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I gotcha. Um, so then he tries to call Mara back three times, 221, 222, and 224. So he's just calling over and over again, and she never answered. Um, now, many people discussing the case report that Mara had packed up her dorm room, took the pictures off the wall, and put all her stuff in boxes. And it's also been reported, which we had reported this at some point because it has been reported by really reputable sources um that she printed out an email from billy and then left it on top of the boxes and this email was about him cheating on her three years ago can you meanwhile packing up her dorm room at the same time yeah yeah well here's what i know my brother curtis and my mom visited mara before she disappeared after she moved into the dorm and they went up into the dorm because mara was excited to show my brother and my mom her dorm so they saw it they were there and when shown the pictures after the disappearance of the dorm room my brother curtis says 
it looks more unpacked than when I had seen it shortly before she, after she moved in. So I don't think it, I know it wasn't like Mara to immediately unpack everything. That's mm-hmm. me. I do that. Mara would not never do that. <laughs> so it, I could see her taking time. You know, she's getting ready for classes. She, she's catching up with friends. Unpacking is not the priority for right. her at that time. Mm-hmm. And also they're, they got hit with snow. So she was probably hanging out with people because everyone was off school. Um, so I believe my brother in his accounting of seeing the dorm room, cause I wasn't there. Um, but he believed she was more unpacked after she, uh, disappeared. The other thing is many of the Christmas gifts that were given to Mara to include the jacket I gave her that Christmas was unpacked and hanging in the closet. And, um, the printed email was, um, reported by police themselves as a personal note. And the implication of that is obvious when it was, in fact, a two-year-old email. And it wasn't on top of the boxes. It was inside a program, inside a box. So so not a freshly written personal note. No. And when people hear personal note, you know, they're thinking maybe it, it could possibly be a suicide note. Right. Yeah. It was a two-year-old email. Just... I don't know if she kept it. I don't know when she printed it, but that's why language is so important because by calling it a personal note, the implication is right. it was a suicide note when it was, it wasn't even, it was from Bill. She didn't yeah. even write it. Yeah. That's, that is. How did they get that mistake. so wrong? That is, that is absurd. It's just lazy work, honestly. Or trying to play into a certain theory. To their benefit. Yeah, that's crazy. Because the way that that could be perceived is, you know, she had packed up the whole, that it was a completely unpacked room, that she packs everything up and then leaves this note there like it's all left on purpose as like some sort of clue or that there's so much more to it than maybe there actually is. Yeah. Okay, so then shortly after this, she leaves campus in her Saturn. And at 3.15, she stopped at an ATM and withdrew $280, leaving just $16 in her account and there's actually surveillance footage of it. Um, you can see, I mean, what do you make of the the still images that were taken? Well, they're they're really low quality. Yeah. Uh, they're really grainy. It's hard to even get the expression. I mean, she doesn't look happy. I can say that. Yeah. Um, but it also could just be she's getting money out of right. an ATM. I don't know what I look yeah, like. What I- <laughs> yeah, what face do you make? Like, yeah. So thrilled Smiling to get at the it. ATM. Yeah, totally. Yeah. So it's hard to get to get anything, to get any clues off those photos. Trust me, I've tried. I've studied those photos for hours mm-hmm. trying to see if I'm, I'm missing something. Mm-hmm. But they're just, the quality is just so low. I, I don't really get a whole lot out of them. Well, she could be kind of frowning or scowling because she's withdrawing almost all of her money out of her account too. But she can't even really tell if she's scowling. No, no. I mean, there's no way to tell. It's just like you said, it doesn't look like she's happy. She's not like, you know, thrilled to be there, but, but again, she doesn't you can't look tell. like, you know, outright stressed or scared and, and there's no one else with her. And that's, that's important to, to note as well. Um, but after withdrawing the money, she went to the liquor store and spent $40 on alcohol um, which I know there's been some reporting about what exactly that was. Do you know exactly what type of alcohol she bought? Mm-hmm. Yep. Um, the receipt for that purchase was found in her abandoned car. Mm-hmm. So it was the ingredients to make one of her favorite drinks, which was a black Russian. So Kahlua vodka, a nip of Bailey's, one of those small little um, $2 ones. Mm. Uh, and there was also a box of, Franzia wine that she had purchased on the Saturday night mm. that was found inside her abandoned car opened. I that was from the party on Saturday, and then there was malt beverages with a twelve pack with eight gone. Mm. Okay, so she also recycled seventy nine cans for three dollars and ninety five cents. Um, this has been kind of talked about. It seems like it's would be like an odd thing to do if you were planning to disappear. Yeah. What do you make of it? Well, it's a lot of effort yeah. to, to take all that time to get carry. 
first of all, carry 79 cans yeah. and take the time to redeem them for just such a small amount of money, $3.95. Mm-hmm. I mean, Mara was, she hated to litter and, you know, she was mm. environmentally conscious, but um, it just seems like an odd thing to do if if she was planning to disappear. And that's a data point that leads me to believe that wasn't her plan. And another reason that kind of leads you to believe her plan wasn't to disappear is at some point that afternoon, she goes and picks up those accident report forms that your dad asked her to get from the Massachusetts Registry of Motor Vehicles. Um, and so she had those on her signaling that she was planning to bring them to your dad at some point, right. you know, so that's also strange. Um, between four and 5 PM, she left Amherst and started driving North to New Hampshire, just over the Massachusetts border at four thirty seven, She called the voicemail of her cell phone again. And then at five, her phone pinged a cell phone tower within 20 miles of uh, Londonderry, New Hampshire. Am I saying that right? Yes. Londonderry. So then at 7.27 p.m., a woman named Faith Westman hears a loud sound outside of her home in Haverhill, New Hampshire. And Faith saw a black car up against a snowbank facing, facing west in the eastbound lane. And she calls the police to report an accident. She tells the dispatcher that she thought she saw a man in the passenger seat smoking a cigarette now this has been a very obviously a big point of contention here what do you make of that i think it's odd because what people don't realize is how close the westman's window was to the saturn so yes mara disappeared on a a small in in a small village up in haverhill new hampshire but the location where she went missing, there was quite a few neighbors. And so for Faith to be so close and to, to say that she saw a man smoking a cigarette, um, it's interesting to me, um, but it was also very, very dark that night. So we know that Mara always wore her hair up, so maybe she saw, saw the silhouette of somebody with their hair up and thought it was a man. Oh, that makes sense. Yeah. Could she have been smoking too? Well, Mara didn't smoke, um, so I don't think she picked up that habit in the time. The last time I saw her over that Christmas, maybe a one off, stressed may- out, like maybe, yeah, yeah, it's possible, hmm. but it's odd. Yeah. Well, it's now a common belief that it's possible that was her cell phone. Her cell phone did have a light on it; it was a flip phone. Um, so maybe she thought that and thought it was a cigarette. I mean, it's still somewhat far to like easily yeah. misidentify something. Well, her husband was also home. Tim Westman was also home and he looked out the same window that Faith looked out and they disagree on whether it was a man smoking a cigarette. Mr. Westman thinks it was the light from a cell phone. So okay. they can't even agree on what it was. To this day? I, I, I do believe that Faith now thinks it was the light from a cell phone okay yeah okay which would make more sense yeah and they didn't go out to investigate so yeah they they were just looking through the window yeah and obviously they had no idea no what this was going to turn into or what was truly going on here they're right. just reporting an accident so yeah they're not like super attention to detail here um but a second neighbor also saw someone walking around the crashed car um so what do you think of that? Do you think someone could have actually been there? Well, we know that there was a rag stuffed in the tailpipe, and that rag would have come from Mara's trunk. So at some point, Mara would have had to access the trunk, and so maybe that's what the neighbor saw. Okay. It's it's called this flurry of activity at the trunk. Hmm. Yeah. Well, since you brought it up, I, I'd like to get into the, rail and the, the rag in the tailpipe because that's been widely debated and people are all over the place with that so how what was the point of that how did that happen did your dad tell her to put it there and why it was bad advice or advice that my dad thought might possibly work would work but probably wouldn't he had never tried it before but he told her if you are in an emergency and you absolutely have to drive the saturn that i don't think is safe for you to drive and if it's smoking this badly what you could do 
And he even says, I don't think it'll work, but you could try to put a rag in the tailpipe and it might mask the smoke if you're trying to avoid police. Because if police see this smoke, they're obligated to to pull you over. And it was a wing and a prayer from my dad. Yeah. It, he did not want her to drive the car. He did not think that she would ever use this as advice because she wasn't supposed to be driving the car. Okay. Because, yeah, so many people have read far into that. Um, but when we covered it, I remember there was a lot of comments saying that they had also heard of that in the past, that they've been told that or have heard that it's kind of like a myth that it can help or something yeah, like that. Yeah, other people definitely do that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's not like or total, like he just made it up. Like yeah. this is a, a known thing. Um, so just before 7.30, Mara was driving eastbound on Route 112. She ended up uh, losing control of the car on a curve and slid off of the road. Just to give more context to how the accident happened. Can you describe... You've driven this many times. Yeah. Will you just describe what this looks like and what this... Where she crashes, like how steep... Is it a super steep curve? Like what's kind of the road in that area? It's a sharp, almost 90 degree turn. Okay. And it's on a pretty narrow road. And the night that Mara disappeared, the roads were dry. There was a snowstorm earlier in the week. So there was snow accumulations over two feet. But that night it was dry, but it was very cold in the low 20s and it was very dark. So there's this big red barn on the corner. And as you make that left going east, you have to navigate this corner that it, that road's pretty treacherous. I mean, there's potholes, frost heaves, um, and especially it seems more narrow with the snow banks. Right. That makes sense. Yeah. yeah. But um, dark, dark. And there had been accidents on that corner before. So it wasn't uncommon for people to have trouble navigating not only that corner, but other corners on that stretch of road. Okay. Yeah. So when her car came to a stop, it was facing the wrong way. And what is the extent of the damage to the car? Because there's also reports that have gone out there of like slid into a tree and that's not true. So how much damage was there to the Saturn? Both airbags deployed, which in her type of model could happen if there was only a driver and not a passenger. Okay. The driver's side windshield was cracked. The front of the driver's side bumper was pushed in, but it was pushed in at such an angle that it didn't match up to the way the damage would appear if she hit a tree. And so we had a accident vehicle reconstructionist look over the vehicle and he said the damage to the front bumper is not consistent with hitting a tree because it was kind of angled so if you look at pictures of it the Mm -hmm. the headlights undamaged yeah that would have been busted by a tree yeah um so it looked like there was something that it it she hit something at an angle to where it scraped it to where the the light um wasn't damaged and, then, and and it looks like on the hood, it's like almost got impact going downwards onto the top of the hood where it kind of pushes the headlight back behind right. the top of the hood a little bit, which is interesting. So, yeah. which again, the Saturn's not a very, I mean, it's a pretty low sitting car. So, yeah. you know, talking about snow bank two feet, two feet tall or so, I mean, definitely looks like it could be running into that or. So since there was a crack to the windshield, do you believe that she possibly could have, that that was caused by a head injury? I believe it could have possibly been a head injury or it could have been the impact of the airbag or it could have been another object. I've talked to a lot of people about it and people said it's similar to accidents they've had where it's the impact of the airbag and not necessarily somebody's head. Right. Okay. Well, there would be likely blood and mm-hmm. other things like that if it was your head smashing into the windshield like that. And there was not. Right. Mm-hmm. So it makes sense. The airbags are popping out at a high rate of speed. They go up pretty high too. I mean, it's like a big pillow you're you're hitting. So it makes sense it could hit. Because that's been a theory the, I've seen a lot 
is that maybe she got this head injury and then had some sort of amnesia and then left the scene, doesn't know who she is. Like, does that have any validity to you? I, I, it's possible. It's possible she could she could have had a head injury from the Saturday night accident. That's true. Yeah. And so this could have just added to that. And mm-hmm. and if she may have been drinking, so mm-hmm. imagining someone that could have been drinking suffering this blow to the face with an airbag, maybe hitting your head, that's a recipe for disaster in my opinion. And do you believe that she was drinking? I think it's possible, um, but I, we we don't know for sure because no one saw her. And the yeah. one witness that did interact with her, her, um, Butch Atwood, Butch Atwood, the bus driver, he he had he had multiple different variations of his yeah. encounter with her, but he was asked outright by a reporter, and he said she did not appear intoxicated. Okay. But there was, what was it, a Coke bottle that was filled with the Franzia. And then there was alcohol splattered in the car as well. We don't know what was actually in the Coke bottle. Okay. We we assume it was the red liquid, the Franzia wine. Um, but without seeing the results of that testing, I would just be speculating. And. Okay. My assumption is the red uh, liquid aspersions on the driver's side door in the ceiling were most likely wine. But again, I don't have the results of that testing. So this is still before officers have arrived on scene or an A officer has arrived on scene. But at 7.33 p.m., a school bus driver named Butch Atwood saw Mara on the side of the road on his way home from work. He stopped and asked if she needed help. She didn't look hurt like we just mentioned Uh, But she was shivering. It's very cold out. And she's clearly distraught. But again, he doesn't think that she looked intoxicated. Many reports out there say that Mara had already told him she already called AAA and asked him not to call the police. However, we don't know this for sure. She had AAA, though. Correct? Yes. Which Butch, he knew that she wouldn't be able to get coverage out there. I mean, this is a very rural area. I can imagine cell service is not great out there. So, you know, he's probably wondering, well, how are you going to do that? Um, And AAA is no record of a call from Mara. But once Butch got back to his house, he decided to call the police anyway and report the accident. And he described the person as a young woman with her hair down, which you brought up is very weird. Seems unusual for her. Very unusual. She always wore her hair up. Hmm. Yeah, I, mean, I guess every picture I've seen of her, her hair was always up. Yeah. Is it possible from the accident her hair came down? I think so. I mean, being hit in the face with the airbag. Yeah. Could, yeah. Mess you up a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> right. Certainly. And then at 746 p.m., Haverhill Police Sergeant Cecil Smith arrived to the scene. And that's when he located the black Saturn. But at this point, Mara was nowhere to be found. Now, Cecil Smith, let's talk about him for a moment because I think a lot, we could know a lot more about this case had we had perhaps somebody a little bit more competent uh, show up at the scene. But what's, what's kind of your take on, on Cecil Smith well, and how he handled this investigation like from the jump? Yeah, I think the initial thought was it was a DUI walk away. Mm -hmm. And so it wasn't taken serious from the minute that he showed up. Which does happen. Sometimes people will yeah, you know, be drinking and driving then leave flee the scene. Yeah. And that that's something he probably had seen many times in the past. But the difference with this is that it's an out of state license. It's a Monday night. Mm -hmm. There's a UMass sticker on the side of Mara's car. There's there's damage, the airbags went off, the windshields crack, and there's evidence of potentially drinking. So it should have been taken seriously because they all knew in that area that there was no cell signal. So here you have a vulnerable person with no communication out from out of state, pro- possibly, probably a student because of the UMass sticker on the car, and may have been drinking. So... 
that's why I don't like this. Let's wait 24 hours before reporting a missing person. Because the window of opportunity to find Mara was that night. And that was lost. Right. Well, isn't he concerned that this person could just be out wandering through the woods and potentially die out there if he doesn't find the driver? It's just, it just seems like why, like what in his mind did he think happened? Like this person got a ride and then just like left flee the scene to avoid getting a DUI and that's kind of the end of it and move on with things. Yeah. But like I said, the, there was so many oddities with the car's positioning, the damage. Um, and it just, in my opinion, it should have been taken seriously from that night. Some, right. a, at least a search should have happened that night. And it, and it wasn't. Yeah. And the first search didn't happen the next day either. The first search didn't happen until Wednesday morning, 36 hours after Mara disappeared. So much wasted time. That's got to be yeah. so frustrating. It's to so think frustrating. About. Yeah. Because, I mean, by that point, cover a lot of miles in that time. Do you think that her case has influenced other departments to possibly make better decisions in situations like this and prevent this from happening to someone else? Absolutely. I think if this happened and the, sa the same circumstances happened today in the same town, I think they would handle it differently. And I think mm -hmm. um, I think this general thought that we we should wait 24 hours is something that law enforcement should take more seriously. Yeah. So Cecil's doing his investigation. Uh, he's running the license plate on the Saturday and finds out that the car is registered to Fred Murray. Cecil then goes to Butch's home and then Butch got into his personal vehicle and searched west down a dirt road near French Pond. Again, the police assumed that Mara had been drinking and that's what caused the accident. They figured she fled the scene of the accident in order to avoid getting a DUI, but would come back once she sobered up. Between 8 and 8.30 that night, a contractor named Rick Forcier was coming home from work and saw a young person walking quickly along Route 112 about five miles from the crash person was wearing jeans and a dark coat with a light hood if we look back at that atm surveillance footage mara was wearing a light color jacket so yeah it's possible this was her that he had seen then at 8 49 mara's car was towed and the scene was cleared mike lavoy the owner of lavoy's towing brought the car to his private home garage so rather than taking it to somewhere secure where it can be forensically looked at it goes the absolute opposite opposite way how do you guys feel obviously you probably feel like that was a mistake yeah. as well but that's just be towed well i just don't get it i don't understand why that would be an option yeah um i have heard in all these years that that had happened before um but the interesting thing about the tow truck situation is that Mike Lavoy wasn't on the call rotation that night. It was another tow operator. His name was Dick McKean. He was on call and he was listening to the scanner. And when he heard the call come in for a tow, he was upset that he didn't get the job. So much so that he drove to the scene and confronted, whether it be Cecil or Mike Lavoy, oh, wow. about why I didn't get the call. So I have still not gotten a clear answer from law enforcement as to why it was Mike Lavoy who wasn't on rotation, why he got the call that night when it was Northland towing Dick McKean's night. For, they rotate to get okay. the call. Um, and why it was taken to the personal garage of a tow operator, I that doesn't make sense to me. It doesn't seem like the right protocols. Mm, uh, but definitely not. <laughs> That was definitely odd. But they never gave you an answer as to why they did that. I still don't know wow. why the rotation schedule was mixed, flipped. What's crazy is that it's not until Tuesday, February 10th, the following day at around 12.30 p.m., that police finally put out a bolo, uh, be on the lookout for Mara. And the car is then searched that morning. And... We know that you hadn't seen the search warrant until a few months ago, but what did you see in there? A lot of information I wish I had known uh, 
the first week. So what I learned from reading the search warrant was there was, I think it was seven items. Uh, it could, there could have been more with Mara's name on the items, identifying her as the likely driver. And this happened at 1020 a.m. on Tuesday. Yet nobody contacted my family until six hours later after they confirmed that it was probably Mara driving. Because you have to remember, my dad had multiple kids. So how did they know, even if it was female, how did they know it wasn't Kathleen or I? Was yeah. it from the UMass sticker? I don't know, maybe. How would they know where I went to school, though, mm -hmm. or if I was in school? So again, another missed opportunity there. Um, but one of the most shocking things that I learned after reviewing this search warrant was there was a handwritten name and number on a note card, a piece of paper in Mara's car. And I just assumed that law enforcement contacted that number because it was in her <laughs> car and think so. she's missing. Right. So I was like, what the heck? I'll, I'll call this number. Of course, I had to do some research because it was a landline, um, but I did find the owner of the number. And this was very recently. Very, very recently. And I contacted them and I said, hey, do you have any idea why your name and number was found in a high profile missing woman in New Hampshire? And they, they said, no, they didn't know initially. And then I asked them if they had ever been contacted by law enforcement, and they said no, which made me fall off my chair. Yeah. Because here I am just assuming, of course they called this number. Of yeah. course they called the condo owner too, Linda Salamon, one of the last calls Mara made that you could find on her cell phone. They didn't call Linda Salamon, the Bartlett condo owner, until nine months after the disappearance, her last, one of her last known numbers. That is maddening. It's maddening. Um, so then I did a little bit more research and I found that this, the owner of this number had ties to our hometown in Hanson. They had a rental unit at Loon Mountain, which was about 25 miles east of where Mara's car was found and in the direction she was traveling. And they had ties to law enforcement in Burlington. So me reading this, I'm already on high alert and I'm thinking, oh, my God, there's there's too many coincidences here. Mm -hmm. um, but when I looked at it further, I haven't been able to link any of those coincidences together. I, of course, passed this info to law enforcement. Um, could it have something to do with it? Maybe. Could it just be nothing? Maybe. But I don't know. Well, that's based off information almost 20 years later. Right. Versus had they followed up on everything they possibly could at the time, your, your information is probably going to be a lot better. Yeah. Hopefully. Have you ever confronted law enforcement about why they never made those calls? One time I did mm -hmm. with oh. the older detective, the, the last detective, not older, last. What, were, what was their response? Just a lot of non-answers. I mean, I'm sure they're just like, what do you want me to do? Yeah. Basically. Yeah. It's just really frustrating for all of these missed opportunities. Something that, you know, I'm not an investigator. I'm a sister with a missing sister. I know that it's important to call the missing person's last known numbers. Yeah. If even I know that. I think most people would think about it. Yeah. Like that, you know, it makes it makes no sense. It's incredibly so, frustrating. When I say they did the bare minimum, they did less than the bare minimum. Yeah. Initially. Yep. What else did they find in the search warrant? Or did you find in the search warrant? Um, a couple other interesting things. Um, one was they did have her AAA card that was in her car. Um, and some of the alcohol, but some of the alcohol was obviously missing which is another odd thing. Yeah. And uh, one or two other pieces that I don't, I'm not talking about publicly that were interesting, uh, but I don't want to jeopardize the investigation. Okay. Good. So, and just to name some of the other things they found, in addition to the AAA card, the blank accident report forms, black leather gloves, um, which have some significance to it, but also aren't that significant. 
makeup, diamond jewelry, CDs, map quest directions to stow in Burlington, college textbooks, a syllabus, birth control pills with three missing, an over-the-counter sleep aid like Tylenol PM, her favorite stuffed animal monkey, and a bag of clothes. They also found a New Hampshire license reinstatement form because Mara had gotten a speeding ticket, right? that summer and her license was actually suspended in the state of new hampshire and so she had to file this form in person and you learned via the search warrant that it was in the vehicle yes okay and you found that out pretty recently yes yeah because we knew that we knew she had a speeding ticket we knew that she had to pay a fine and she did pay that fine i actually saw the check written out my dad paid it for uh, written out to pay the fine but she had to, in the state of New Hampshire, you had to fill out this form to get it reinstated even after you paid your fine. And you had to do that in person. And I didn't know that that form was actually in her abandoned car until I saw the search warrant, mm. which okay. could be a huge red flag or could be a reason why she was in new hampshire i can't say for sure right but she did have it in the car and i don't know if she realized that her license was suspended and she had to complete this form i've thought that maybe when she was in the accident on saturday the officer that cited her for um driver inattentiveness may have informed her hey Mm. you're he pulled a record. Hey, you have a suspended license in New Hampshire. Did you know that? That's just me speculating. I don't know if that's how it happened or how she knew or when she knew. But I do know that that form was in the car. Okay. They also found the book Not Without Peril by Nicholas Hauer, which uh, this book offers an extensive and intimate uh, profiles of people who found trouble on New Hampshire's presidential reign or the White Range, a.k.a. the White Mountains. And um, this is all the way from the 19th century through present day. What do you make of this? I know a lot of people have, you know, there's all types of theories about this book. Um, Like, could she have been going to go hiking? And, you know. Yeah. Well, I can tell you the backstory in the book. So I was with Mara when we got the book. We had just finished hiking Mount Washington, which is the highest peak in New Hampshire. And my dad had a goal to climb all the 4,000 foot peaks in New Hampshire. And he, he did that. And everyone in my family at different times joined him for those hikes because we liked hiking too. And on the hike up to New Hampshire, we were coming back down after this grueling hike. And we went to the gift shop and the author, Nicholas Howe, was in there signing books and we're like whoa this is super cool because the book talked about all those climbs that we had all done and misadventure and stuff like that so he signed the book for us and um we we got it and it became one of maura's favorite books she read it multiple times and it was in her car people have thought that that meant she was going up to new hampshire to um, yeah. whether it be hike or s- some some other reason. Um, but she definitely wasn't equipped with any sort of warm yeah. weather gear to hike. She had no winter gear, no hat, you know, a couple pairs of gloves, one singular sock. That's what she had with her. She didn't have boots with her, uh, you know, in the ATM, she's not wearing boots. So she didn't have the right gear to go hunt- hiking. I don't think she was... Going hiking. It was okay. just one of her favorite books with a cool backstory. Yeah. Okay. So people have read too much into that. Also, yeah. to correct myself, I said Nicholas Howard. It is Nick- Nicholas Howe. Um. Okay. So her wallet, her license, her car keys, or uh, yeah, her car keys, her credit cards, and her phone were not in the car, and they believed she took a black backpack with her too. Is that correct? Yes. Okay, and then at 3.20, they called Fred and left a message that his car had been abandoned, but he was working out of state at the time and didn't get the message. Around 5 p.m., one of Mara's sisters called Fred to tell him, was that Kathleen? Yes. Um, You know, tell him what was going on, and the police officially reported Mara missing at that point. 
Um, now, how did you hear about the crash and Mara being missing? I can't remember who called me. I believe it was probably my dad that called me. I was at Fort Bragg, North Carolina, and I got the call Tuesday evening right around the same time, and I had no idea what was going on or why she'd be in New Hampshire on a Monday night. Yeah. It's definitely strange. I mean, what were your like initial thoughts? Did you feel like panicked right away or did you think it was confusion at first? Like, yeah. what do you mean? She's yeah. missing. What, yeah. How could this be? Why? Why is she in New Hampshire? And that quickly turned to panic because we realized she went missing the night prior and she's still missing. And so then it got it got real. So was your what was your next like course of action? Well, at that at that point, I was slated to deploy to Iraq. Oh, right, right. So I needed to find someone to replace me, which mm -hmm. was hard to do because those deployments were over a year long. Mm -hmm. So it took me quite a while to find a replacement. I I did, and then I got emergency leave and headed to New Hampshire. How close to when she disappeared were you supposed to deploy? Um, it was a couple months. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I didn't know that you could have somebody take your, take your, uh, deployment spot. Is it's, that... it's rare. You're not supposed yeah. to, you're not supposed yeah. to. And here I come in as a bottom of the barrels. You know, I think I was a first Lieutenant at that time. My first, my second real duty station. And on the surface, it looks like I'm trying to get out of a deployment because no one wanted to go. Yeah. So that was hard for me. Yeah, and did you try to explain to people what was going on? Yeah. I mean, once I explained how serious the situation was, then, you yeah. know, I, my emergency leave was no problem. And mm -hmm. I think my commander even told me to, you know, I could go back and which I did multiple times. Okay. So that brings us to February 11th, 2004. Um, early Wednesday morning, Billy gets on a flight from Fort Sill, Oklahoma to New Hampshire to help look for Mara. Um, while he was going through security, he ended up getting a voicemail from an unknown number. And when he listened to the message, he hears soft breathing, crying, a whimper, and sniffling. Have you heard this voicemail yourself? I have not. No. And have you spoken to him about it? Yes. My dad heard the the voicemail. Oh, he did. My dad heard it. And so did New Hampshire State Police. Okay. Or um, Haverhill Police. So when Bill arrived on Wednesday night, he let my dad hear it. And my dad just heard muffled, muffled noises, oh. just static. My dad did not hear what Billy interpreted. Okay. Have the police said what, what they make of it? They said that they determined it was a call from a Red Cross number, a calling oh. card from the Red Cross, which is perplexing because why would the Red Cross call from a calling card? Yeah. You're right. Yeah. <laughs> and so I, I mean, that's what law enforcement told us. Hmm. It, it's, it's weird. Well, how'd they even figure that out? I wonder. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I know. I'm like, that's so weird. So Billy at the time was positive that it was Mara, but how does he feel now? He now, my best guess is he agrees that it was not and mm -hmm. agrees with my dad that it was just w more wishful thinking sure. you know, on his part. Especially in a time like that when you get a call and you're going to hear what, you know, your brain has ways of making <laughs> you think you hear things. Too. Right. Yeah. And my dad even said he desperately wanted that call to be Mara. Of course. But he just, it just sounded like muffled noises. Okay. Okay. So she did use prepaid cards all the time because she didn't have her own cell phone, obviously super normal, um, for 2003. Um, and the Thanksgiving before, Billy had given, Billy's mom had given Mara two prepaid phone cards and Billy eventually added her to his plan and she got that smart smartphone. Um, but detective, not sorry, smart not, phone. not smartphone, phone. Samsung no smart flip phone. phone. Mm -hmm. No smartphones back then. So around 8 a.m., official search was started for Mara, and your dad and other family members joined in 
with the search, were you there? On Wednesday, no. No. Okay. Were you still like in the process of trying to, to right. get back? Okay. Um, so a police dog did trace the scent of her glove a hundred yards before losing the trail, leading investigators to believe that someone had maybe picked her up. But there is a lot to be said about them using these gloves. Right. She got the gloves that Christmas. You know, so roughly three weeks. No, more than three weeks. However many weeks it was yeah. before she disappeared in February. There were leather gloves, and we can't say for certain whether she ever wore those gloves. Mm. Maybe she just had them with her in the yeah. car in case they she were, needed them. They were brand new as a gift. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I never saw her wear those gloves when I was home over Christmas. Mm. So your family feels that they would have had much better luck if they actually came to you and asked you for an item that would make more sense, that they could easily trace her scent um, more effectively. Right. We we wish we would have at least been consulted in the selection of the scent item because there were so many things within the car that they could have chosen that we could have more confidence in that she wore that mm. and... They didn't consult us, even though my dad was right there. Right. And to confirm this was fish and game, right? That was out there searching? Yeah. Okay. Yes. It just, God, I'm sure it might have been different. Had they gotten those search dogs out there the night she went missing oh, when yeah. the scent was fresh? Because again, like, how long does scent last outside for, you know? Not not as long as you would think, as far as I understand well, the it. The longer you take, it's like yeah. dissipating more. Right. Yeah. And it, it was New Hampshire. They were treating the roads, so that could contribute to, to it. But we've we don't have much we don't put a lot of faith in this the scent item because we don't we don't believe that she ever wore those gloves. Okay. So then Around 5 p.m. that evening, Billy was interrogated by the police, first alone and then with his parents. Do you know, was there anything significant that came out of that? Just the standard questions, I assume. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And then by 7 p.m., investigators had already concluded that Mara had driven to the area with plans to either run away or to kill herself. And I'm sure that is honestly just so offensive. It really is because everything that we were trying to tell the investigators was this something's gone wrong. This is not like Mara. She was not suicidal. That isn't something that she would do. And it was just like we were talking to a wall. Mm -hmm. no, no input was really considered from us, the people that knew her, mm -hmm. which is super frustrating when you're not being heard. Yeah. I can't imagine. I would just lose my mind with anger. Yeah. Um, one thing I wanted to jump back to, I forgot to bring this up earlier, but there are a lot of rumors and speculation that Mara could have been pregnant. Where does that come from and what do you make of that? That comes from the fact that Mara looked up maternity terms in the wee hours of the morning of February 9th. She was doing her homework assignment, and her homework assignment was to look up maternity terms. Oh. She was in <laughs> well, nursing, okay. yeah. See, yeah. That's never reported. Yeah, so it was literally her assignment to look up maternity terms, which she did, and she submitted at 3.32 a.m. on the day she disappeared. Wow. So okay. I think that's... Who's doing their homework exactly. when they're about to go? Yeah, so that's I think that's where it, that got convoluted, yep. is the searches for maternity terms when that was the assignment. Wow, okay, see that? That needs to be spread far and wide because that is something that so many people believe. I am I think at one point we have even reported that incorrectly in the past um, because yeah, there's there's reputable sources that report that without the context behind it and that's that's so frustrating. Yeah. Okay, I just wanted to make sure we, we covered that as well. Um, so from the very beginning pretty much, your father, Fred, not happy with the police response, not happy with the way they're handling the case. They're starting to 
go the opposite direction from what you guys feel happen tomorrow. And you're requesting like, hey, if you guys aren't going to take this seriously, if you're not going to investigate what we feel is foul play, can we get the FBI involved? But you had mentioned to me earlier that why wouldn't they get involved? She's crossing state lines. You know, there's multiple factors here that you guys felt like would warrant additional support for local law enforcement. And what was their local law enforcement's response when you asked for the FBI? Well, we were frantic, absolutely frantic. We knew something had gone wrong. We wanted the best resources. We wanted all the help we could get. At that point, the first week, the only people up there was the few people that we could pull together that could make the trip. So we're talking single digits. That's who was looking for Mara the first week, other than the line search um, and the the fish and game search on Wednesday. It Once that was done, it was just my family. And so we knew that we this small police department in Haverhill, four officers deep, they needed more resources. And we thought, okay, well, since she crossed three states, Massachusetts, Vermont, into New Hampshire, that would warrant FBI assistance. But New Hampshire had to invite them, and they refused to do it. Now, the FBI did participate in some interviews in New York at West Point and in Massachusetts, but in a very limited capacity. So New Hampshire would tell my family, the FBI is involved. Mm. And we're like, well, no, no they're not. Sort of. yeah. <laughs> so it, it, was, it was a fight from the beginning. We were frantic. We wanted, we wanted all the resources we could get, and we were just hitting a brick wall. Which makes sense for why they're bringing in fish and game, which is kind of odd. But like you don't see that a whole lot. Was there any like search and rescue organizations in that area, like independent from law enforcement that got involved or not available? A, yeah, not initially. It was just New Hampshire Fish and Graham Game, who had a great track record up until that point. The lead officer, Todd Bogardis, had only one unsolved case that he looked at for a missing person, missing or murdered. Mara was his second lifetime total unsolved wow. cases. Wow. Yeah. So pretty... I mean, pretty credible resume. Um, and Mara was the second case that remained unsolved. Wow. But they did bring in thermal imaging, tracking dogs, cadaver dogs, helicopter. Yep. So all the resources that they had at their, their disposal. Didn't find anything. Right. No, and th the biggest tell is no footprints in the snow. Mm -hmm. So if she left the roadway, the lead... Fish and game officers said he, they would have found those footprints. And at the end of their search, he said all footprints were accounted for, meaning they weren't Mars. So there were no footprints in the snow. And he was adamant that if she had left that roadway, we would have found her. God, wow. What do you make of that? She didn't leave the roadway. Yeah. <laughs> she, she got into a vehicle is what I think. Someone picked her up. Yeah. So it wasn't until July that investigators took items from her car in for forensic analysis. And then they also did their first search of the area without snow and still never found any trace or any clue um, of what could have happened to her. Um, does your family, what was, how is your family feeling at that point? Still early on, but you know, couple months in yeah we were we were still fueled off of adrenaline and panic and nervous energy the weight of it all and the um like we didn't have time at that point to have it set in to like really understand that this could be this could go on for one year two years 5, 10, 15, 20 years. We had no idea. We thought it was going to be solved. Of course it was going to be solved. We just had to wait for the snow to melt. And then when the snow melted, still nothing was found after a mm. huge line search. Yeah, I mean, we, we felt a little bit of a despair. But one thing my family's been great about is never losing hope. Mm -hmm. Because the minute you lose hope, 
you know, that's a hard hole to bring yourself back out of. Yeah. And at this point, Mar needs us. And yeah. so we can't, we need to stay in the fight. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It just seems like based on everything, especially after searching when the snows melted, that she clearly left that, that area in a vehicle and it's just i'm like why didn't law enforcement just go that direction years and years ago and pursue that to the fullest extent to see where that path leads as opposed to kind of sticking to this right. other theory like that to me is my biggest question for them is why why did you spend so much time on a theory that has seemingly been disproved multiple times multiple ways I just and i'm sure your dad you know feel the same way he's probably just yeah. like why 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 yeah. are we wasting so much time yeah well that's why two years later my dad sued the state of new hampshire to get the case files under foia uh, because he figured if they're not going to do anything with these files he's certainly not going to sit back passively and wait for them to inform us of a lead my dad wanted to be up there pursuing leads talking to people but if he's closed off from what the police are doing he felt he he was already having to do his own concurrent investigation because they weren't sharing anything and so eventually that case went to the new hampshire supreme court and they denied our request to see the files because it was investigatory in nature and releasing them could prevent um, law enforcement proceedings in the future. But at that time, the assistant attorney general said that there was a 75% chance of law enforcement proceedings, hmm. meaning they're, they were close to getting some sort of justice. And that was in 2007. And here I am in 2024. <laughs> And there's been nothing, no movement on that 75% chance. And still very few records that have been released. Um, and as a result of that court case, the state of New Hampshire actually instituted, adopted the Murray exemption named after my dad's case. And it's still used in case law today up in New Hampshire to uh, hold back files that may be investigatory in nature and you'll see it cited all over the place where wow. oh wow yeah where it, they cite the murray exemption your father has been pretty outspoken about his frustrations with law enforcement from the beginning and treating the investigation as a disappearance and not a criminal case however by 2014 he stated publicly that he wasn't sure if his daughter was dead. Now, how does he feel now? Well, everybody in my family believes Maura is no longer with us. Okay. And that was a hard transition to make. Yeah. And you could see even in our interviews, we use present tense and then past tense. So when I am in interviews, I use past tense because I believe in my heart that she's no longer with us. I believe that because there have been no credible sightings in 20 years. Nothing has ever been found. And she, my mother passed away on Mara's birthday after suffering with cancer. And my sister Kathleen passed away from the same cancer. They were both in the hospitals, in and out, in hospice. Mm. If Mara was able to be here, especially mm. for that, being... Yeah. Uh, studying to be a nurse, she would have been here. So yeah. it's it's hard. That's a, that was a hard transition for everybody in my family to make. But we all, I mean, it's the worst. It's the worst possible outcome for Mara and my family. I don't want to believe that. I want to believe she's out there somewhere. Mm -hmm. But at this point, 20 years later, I have to live in this reality that I sit in every day. So before you came to that conclusion were you hopeful that maybe she had left or was being possibly held captive somewhere like where what were you thinking in the early days oh i thought the worst the worst yeah. it was not healthy oh, it was sure. not healthy because 
every day you're sitting there thinking, um, you know, I'm sitting back drinking this cold soda and eating the sandwich. What if Mara's in a basement somewhere yeah. and she needs me and uh. I'm and I'm sitting here doing nothing and you just guilt yourself and it's not a healthy place to be. Mm-hmm. And it was always the thought of I should be doing more. I shouldn't yeah. be happy. What what are you doing to watching a TV show? You should be looking at files. And at some point you learn that balance <laughs> and uh you realize that's not a healthy attitude to have and then you you do find that balance and you're able to have a life as well as continue to raise awareness and advocate for your sister but it 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 was definitely a process yeah was there any part of you that thought maybe she willingly left and was out there somewhere starting a new life i know that's a a huge theory i don't believe that one second even in the early days you didn't believe that absolutely not mara loved us all yeah she would not put my dad my mother through this i think that's an interpretation that a lot of people have that something horrible happened there was some incident or something was going on in her life that she didn't want anyone to know about so she made this whole plan to run away to disappear i mean there's theories that she joined a cult like it is all over of course with i mean there's benefits to getting a lot of eyes on a case of course more awareness is better but it also brings out all the theories and these people coming out of the woodwork that are very confident with what they think happened. And how has that been kind of navigating some of these uh, somewhat just a lot of them disturbing theories? Yeah, that's been that's been a challenge uh, because of Mars case is so well known that you have people that become so obsessed and so just convinced that they're right and will not hear any. Yeah. anything else even if there's new information better information they don't want to hear it mm. um so i've learned not to go into comment sections <laughs> it's not he- it's not healthy it's not uh, stay away from reddit that's one thing i i it's not healthy for families of the missing to go into their subs and read all the stuff ab- about Oh, it gets Themselves. wild in there. Yeah. yeah. It's a breeding ground. It's yeah. terrible. I never go. I there. call it a, a troll farm. It is a troll farm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. For sure. Um, yeah. So I, I avoid that. So you learn as you go through this. I have 20 years experience in learning what's safe and not and what's helpful and not. And I know that I have a limited amount of energy to spend each day and I have to be choosy on how I'm going to spend that energy. And my choice is not to get into uh, internet wars with yep. anonymous trolls yep, or gotta... even even people that aren't trolls mm-hmm. be baited into an internet war that does nothing to further my sister's case. It's just a distraction. It's a, yeah. Day. So I'm not, you're not going to find me there. What about the theories that people have? And I mean, we don't even have to spend any time on this. I just wanted to give you the opportunity to kind of clear up some of these theories Um, there are people who think that she was experiencing schizophrenia, major depressive disorder, bipolar disorder. Obviously, there's no evidence to suggest she was dealing with any of these. I'm sure they're very hurtful to your family. It's just unfair to Mara because Mara, I talk about what Mara was struggling with and it was a mental health issue with the eating disorder. Mm -hmm. And one thing that I can say is she was seeing a counselor, whether it was the best form of counseling, I don't know. But she was. And so I've actually reached out to that counselor and I asked her if there were any files that she had kept or were there any symptoms or signs of other potential illnesses or any things that Mara mentioned. And she said no. No. And so without evidence, yeah, we can sit here all day and speculate about what mental illness she had and armchair diagnose her. Yeah. But it's just not fair to Mara. Yeah. Yeah. So I, agree. I have to ask you, what what do you feel in what's what theory or what what makes most sense to you at this point after thinking about everything over and over again for 20 years? Is there is there one theory or idea that you've really landed on? I think she got into a vehicle and I think whoever she got into that vehicle with did her harm 
Do you think it could have been someone she knew or do you think it was just wrong place, wrong time? I don't close any doors. I, d- I don't know. Could be I, either. It could be either. Yeah. Someone could have followed her up there. And that's why the time that she's there and then gone is so quick. Yeah. It just, yeah. I mean. But there's, uh, what we do know is we have her cell phone records and police have access to her online internet activity and chats. So if it was someone that she knew, there probably would have been some sort of footprint, digital footprint, Mm -hmm. whether it be in form of phone calls, whether it be dorm phone records, cell phone records, instant messengers, emails. There would have had to have been some sort of discussion, you yeah. would think. If organization this, of it. Yeah. Some organization, and there just doesn't seem to be any of that. Right. So that kind of makes me think, could it possibly be just a wrong place at the wrong time? I think that's possible because there's no planning and evidence of her concocting a meetup of some sort yeah unless it was face to face and again this was back in 2004 so that that could have been been true yeah and and just to to really close the book on it um obviously there are a lot of people out there that still believe that maybe she was that she had left to end her own life or decided to end her own life after having this accident um why do you believe that that is not true? Because we don't have a body. Yes. Yeah, with all the searching. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, those woods have been searched and searched and searched, and nothing has ever been found. And I, I get the argument that, you know, it's dense forest, there's animals, there could have been scattering of bones. Okay, I get that. But also scattering of belongings. And so at some point, someone probably would have found that yeah. something. Yeah. Um, maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. And there, I mean, you guys have also been vocal about how you don't think there were any signs in her life that she would have wanted to end her own life. Yeah. I mean, of, of course she was going through a rough path. Yeah. That's undeniable, but uh-huh. she didn't have any sort of suicidal ideation that okay. I, know of that i'm aware of she didn't write any type of note i feel like she would have done something like that she was so close with all of you and yeah she also had those plans to go to dane cook coming up yeah all the future planning yeah she had the she was gonna go see dane cook who she loved she was gonna come see me over spring break yeah i mean there was future she was gonna get a job and be close to bill there was a lot of plans for the future the accident forms the accident. At the yeah. very minimum, like yeah. the accident. who goes and <laughs> does that up. if they're already thinking these things? Yeah. I always go back to the, uh, you know, I'm really curious. Has, have you do- dove into the crime in this area? And like, is there other similar types of abductions, murders? Obviously, there's Larry and Claude Moulton and the A frame, um, you know, criminals nearby who maybe just saw this as a, a window of opportunity she's in this you know she's just been in an accident she's wandering on the side of the road and somebody just was like oh perfect opportunity to to take advantage well there's certainly a ton of unsavory characters (laughs) we'll put it that way up in that area and you have to remember this is an area that people flock to because it is private it is off the beaten path in some ways, it's it's quiet. Um, it's not like living in the city, and people want that. Um, but also, with those types of places, there comes the drug problems and sexual predators. And I mean, that's everywhere. But in the, in the particular area where Mara went missing, there are certainly their fair share of bad actors. Okay. And as far as we know, she was alone, so it could made of her a prime target for somebody yeah. that night. Alone in an unfamiliar area, no cell phone signal. Right. And for all we know, she was followed. And somebody, you know, what do you think about her being like run off the road or something like that? Obviously. 
I not mean, a ton of evidence for it, but well, is it possible? One thing I didn't mention is the there was a white scuff mark on the right. driver's side yep. rear bumper, and I'm I hadn't seen that before, but that is that is something that interesting could have maybe she got into some sort of incident before the weathered barn corner i don't know i don't know where that white scuff mark came from hmm. so definitely impossibility no you just brought up the the a-frame and larry and claude i don't know if we have enough time to go into all of that today is that something that you get into on the podcast okay yeah Okay. We we've talked about it too in detail yeah, before yeah, about we have. you know that they I mean ultimately they yeah, said maybe you that can the kind of summarize real quick. Yeah, so there was just rumors that they had killed Mara in that house. Claude had a criminal record, Larry had a history of drug use, and former police officer John Smith presented evidence for Mara's case claiming she was murdered by Larry and Claude. Fred claimed Larry sent him a rusty stained knife that he found in Claude's glove compartment. Uh, Claude and his girlfriend were acting strange, just basically a bunch of kind of bizarre activity. And Claude and other family members said Larry's just trying to get reward money by framing him for the murder. And they ended up giving the knife to police and they confirmed that it was tested, but haven't released any info on the results. You want to speak to that a little bit more? Yeah, I mean, it's just an odd situation yeah so here we are a uh, one year after mara disappears and we get the first tangible piece of evidence which is this rusty knife that larry moulton gives my dad and, and implicates his brother in having something to do with mara's disappearance so we were hopeful that th that could have been it and so we turned it over to the police and we never heard anything back on it until recently when they confirmed that they did in fact test it. Um, and then you have all the odd behavior with Claude himself, who has a record, a criminal record and charged with a number of different things and not the best reputation. And so when you put those two things together and then you have a team that goes into that property and has cadaver dogs alerting multiple different cadaver dogs alerting multiple different times. Um, it seems like a re reasonable to look into it. And I have asked law enforcement, you know, have you pursued this? Have you looked into it because of all this evidence? You know, we have a lot of just scattered theories, but this is the one area where we've got multiple different things that are tangible and but at this point we my family is still kind of in the dark in terms of what they've done law enforcement that is really yeah they haven't talked too much about this but they definitely found discolored wood that was possibly discolored from blood and it was definitely animal or it was definitely human blood not animal blood and there's two different dna profiles one male, one unknown. So, but again, the sample is too degraded for further testing, but hopefully with future technology, we'll yeah. be able to do some more testing on it. But I mean, I think there's enough sketchy stuff going on with these two and in this A-frame house that if not Mara, somebody else was potentially something. a victim here. And yeah. I mean, there's human blood in there. So something, something went down and just yeah. based on these two's history... Wouldn't be wouldn't surprise me if there's some uh, foul play going on, but yeah, I mean, then there's like the police conspiracy. You know, people are like, "Oh, the police somehow in on this? Why are they trying? You know, did they try to cover this up so, because they messed up?" I mean, I mean, it's getting very, you know, speculative. But I do see why people perhaps play around with this theory. But I don't know. I mean, you you know better than anybody. Like, you're working with them now, and you know they're. Why would they be still working with you guys if they were trying to cover up? You know some. Yeah. Well, the people that I'm working with now weren't there in 2004, or you know, a, a decade after. Mm -hmm. So I'm not talking about the same people. They're different people. The team I work with now is very cooperative and collaborative and empathetic. That's very different from the team that was in place 
when Mara went missing. And that's where my dad's frustrations are aimed at was the original, uh, the original, the original investigation had some areas that could have been done better. And you're feeling really positive about the team that you have now. Yes. That's, that's great news. Yeah. Yeah. That, really happy to hear that. Yeah. Yeah. That's, and makes it's, me it's hopeful. those small things like getting an email that has a tiny bit of empathy sprinkled in as opposed to just being so transactional. That goes a long way for families like mine that have been doing this for two decades. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 For the longest time, my closet was full of just cheap clothes. I just never really cared about the quality of my clothes, but over time, I noticed that I was going through shirts like crazy. I was constantly having to buy new clothes because the quality just wasn't there. But a game changer for me was Quince. They offer high quality, affordable pieces and luxury essentials for men and women. And not only do they have apparel like cashmere sweaters and jackets and activewear, but they also have loungewear, shirts and polos for men. They have fine jewelry, socks, hats, even travel bags, suitcases, you name it. Quince has got it. So you're truly getting luxury items at an affordable cost, which I love. Plus they partner directly with top factories. Quince cuts to the cost of the middleman and passes the savings on to you. And Quince only works with factories that use safe, ethical, and responsible manufacturing practices and premium fabrics and finishes, which we love that. So if you haven't checked out Quince, they have quite the selection, they even have baby and kids. So they've got the whole family covered with high quality, affordable, luxury essentials indulge in affordable luxury today go to quince.com slash milehar for free shipping on your order and 365 day returns that's q u i n c e dot com slash milehar to get free shipping and 365 day returns quince.com slash milehar well we could certainly sit here all day and talk to you i mean this case is just so so frustrating and if it feels like some, I don't know, maybe it's wishful thinking, but I really do have hope that I, someday that we will at least get some answers, you know, to these questions that we have. It's just, it's unbelievably frustrating. I cannot imagine. I don't know how you do it. Well, I don't have a choice, really, if you think of yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. um, and the other thing is Mara would do it for me. Yeah, she would. Yeah. Mara seemed like such a cool person. Yeah. Like just all the stories about her and how that's why I love media pressures. It's like just so cool to to hear all of these things that you never hear yeah. um, in other coverage and to just how relatable she was. Yeah. Just this young girl, goofball, but had huge, huge dreams for herself, big aspirations and incredibly smart, incredibly talented. It's just it's such a massive loss. Yeah. Um. Before I wanted to jump to a few other questions for you outside of the case, but just to get this out there, if anyone has any information, as we already said, you might have something that you don't think is significant. Even the smallest detail doesn't hurt to call in a tip. So if you if you know anything or you you know you want to get information to the police, you can contact the New Hampshire State Police at six zero three. 846-3333 or 800-852-3411. Actually, jumping back in, <laughs> I know we said we were going to kind of wrap up talking about the case, but um, I did want to, there are some some updates that some of our viewers may not have heard before. Um, recently, Othram Labs was given some soil samples for testing. Unfortunately, they couldn't extract any DNA from it. Is it possible that they could in the future as technology improves or is that kind of a closed door? I don't think it's a closed door. I I think I would we would just need to provide better more viable samples. Okay. Yeah. Um also, you guys had a family computer as many families did back in the day. Um, and this was a computer that Mara had access to the Christmas before she disappeared. And you guys had the hard drive um, analyzed. Did anything come out of it? Well, we tried to have the hard drive analyzed, but there was a problem with, since it was so old, extracting uh, that much information that was useful. So it was kind of a dead end, but it was something that was worth a try. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that was... That's disappointing. 
what co- what computer was this from? Like, what year was this computer made? Oh, we would have had a, we probably only had a year or two years, so early two thousands. Mm. So this would have been like running Windows XP. I <laughs> I don't know. I was there back then, but I don't know. <laughs> Did they? So they they said they couldn't pull any data from it, or was it just like useful data as it relates to the case? Like, could they find your pictures, documents, that kind of stuff, or just nothing? Yeah, I don't I. I don't know if it's nothing, but nothing useful okay. for the case. That's yeah. kind of what I'm thinking too, because yeah. I, I assume they're speaking to. Because like, I I was a I was a uh, in IT, and I was actually a Geek Squad agent for a while, so I used to do a lot of data recovery stuff. So I'm familiar with the process. So I'm just curious on, on what data you could access, because I used to pull hard drives for people all the time and pull data. But my guess is they were looking for like web activity things like that, and back. And Windows XP, and so it's probably a little bit harder to pull pull files like that. And depending on how it was set up, you know, there's a lot of factors to that. Um, but that's unfortunate. Uh, also, try to get access to her MySpace account, which who knows who's even running MySpace these days. Uh, Tom, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, she did have a MySpace account, as many people did around that time, and right. you guys requested access to that, and they just with never- a legal letter, yeah. Yeah, we sent a letter to their legal team. Uh, the my I I'd have to look at the letter, but I don't remember who we sent it to. Uh, but it would have been reviewed by whoever runs MySpace Legal, asking, providing usernames, um, potential passwords based on what we knew, and we tried to gain access to some of those um, chats or you know pri- yeah. pms i don't even right. know what how you communicated oh. messages <laughs> i think they're called yeah it was yeah. like yeah myspace messages yeah but that we weren't able to get anything from that but i mean we'll try anything obviously right yeah that's frustrating because janelle you were just telling me the other day that myspace is like making a comeback or was it you that was telling who's me that? saying that i haven't seen well that. like a few years ago they were trying to like get people to use it but i don't think it's really making a comeback yeah huh Okay. Well, it's not Tom. I think he sold his I don't, hair in it. I'm I don't sure. know. Any, don't think it's Tom. I don't know if anything would, unfortunately, come out of that, even if yeah. we could get access to it. Um, in 2021, Mara's blue ribbon tree was actually cut down for unknown reasons. You have no idea why this happened. Well, the landowner said that they were going to cut the trees down to raise some sort of livestock. Yeah. I mean, it's it's private property. They're right. I asked them, begged them not to, um, ah. but it fell on deaf ears. Okay. I even act- actually offered to buy the land. Really? I offered to lease it for 50 years so that at least they would get something in return. Um, but they were all declined. So the next step was we petitioned for a historical marker. Um, not particularly right at that location, but somewhere where it would be safe to gather and out away from bothering the neighbors. Mm-hmm. Because thousands of people come and pay tribute to her every year, I understand. Well, you're not all at the same time. But yeah. There's definitely like, people that are very interested in seeing the location. Mm-hmm. And it is a dangerous corner and mm-hmm. it is private property. And so we encourage everyone to stay off private property and, um, respect the neighbors that had this tragedy happen right outside their doorstep but didn't ask for it right and so i encourage people not to go knocking on doors and going on private yeah just it's not helpful for anybody so you guys just had a vigil last week yep Uh, how was that it was really moving this year we had a lot of people this year i think at the end, the end head count was about over a hundred. Wow. Yeah. And this was for the 20th anniversary. Yep. We rented a hall and had pictures and we played a tribute video and it was just, it felt good to be surrounded by so many people who care. Yeah. Yeah. God, 20 years. I can't believe it. I know. Does it, does that just feel so surreal to you? It feels surreal in some ways my family feels frozen back in 2004. Mm, Totally. And it's hard to move past that because Mars frozen in 2004. 
You know, there are no new pictures coming out. There are no new memories being made. Um, and so much of my life is revolved around 2004 that I feel it's, it's impossible to go through a grieving process when there isn't resolution. And so what happens is you find yourself just going in these cycles of different phases of the grieving process, mm -hmm. because for us, it's not linear. So it's not like you go through this phase and then you get to this phase and then you can move on from it because you have that resolution. Mm -hmm. Like in traditional loss with right. ambiguous loss, it's a mess. Yeah. It really is emotionally. No, I just, I just cannot imagine what that would be like after 20 years to still not have really I, any solid answers. It's just got to be so insanely frustrating. How's your dad dealing with things? Like, wh where's his mind at? He's he's still fired up. He's 81 now, and um, he keeps himself in tip-top shape. And I know that's mm -hmm. because he doesn't want to, he knows he has more work to do, and he doesn't want to let Mara down. Um, but he's, he's doing good health wise. Uh, we talk every day about Mara and the different avenues we're going to approach. Mm. We usually disagree on approach, but we agree on the end goal. And that is, t we need to find Mara and, um, yeah, we're, we're a good team. We work well together. We butt heads a lot, but <laughs> it, and a lot of it's that new England banter. Like yeah. that's just how we communicate. We, mm -hmm talk smack and that's normal so i think if you overheard a conversation with my dad and i you'd be like what is happening <laughs> it's like we no, we guys mad at each other we love each other you know so much but this is just how we communicate <laughs> it's normal yeah. i understand that yeah and then in r real recent news yeah the uh, attorney general john formella who came to the vigil well, the assistant attorney general. Oh, the assistant did came to the vigil, which was huge. That was really cool. It's yeah. still great to have it that was, acknowledgement. It was so kind. He didn't have to do that, and mm -hmm. I thanked him publicly for it. Um, that meant a lot to my family. So they released an age progress photo produced by the FBI just for on February eighth. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Yeah, it was pretty. What do you think of that? It's pretty crazy to see. We have mixed feelings mm -hmm. about it. I I told people when it first came out that I think I'm a better age progression for Mara than I the, can totally see that than the photo. But I mean it's it doesn't hurt. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Okay. Well, is there anything else you would like to to go over regarding the case or anything you'd like to to say to people who have followed the case or um you know, any final thoughts for now? Well, I would just like to say thank you to everyone that's reached out over the years. I've got a lot of people that have reached out recently with the Media Pressure podcast coming out and people that attended the vigil. It's just comforting to have that love and support. And it is one of the reasons that helps us keep moving forward after all these years, knowing that we have this solid support system that just wants to find answers and wants resolution for Mara. And that's really important. And as people ask me all the time, what can I do to help? What can I do to help? Mm -hmm. And I tell them, just keep talking about Mara, share a missing flyer, engage with content that's victim centered. Things like that go a long way. Uh, and it's easy to do and it doesn't cost anything. And it literally takes two seconds to share a missing flyer or engage yeah. with, uh, a social media post and that's helping it really is so thanks to everyone that stood with me and my family all these years i just can't wait for the day that i get to maybe come back on here and tell you guys how we solved it yeah, yeah i hope for that to day that. too yeah i think yeah. it's very solvable oh, and yeah. i'm glad to hear that you have a seemingly good intention law enforcement team on on your guys's side now and you know I'm, I'm glad you seem so positive about the direction things are going and that gives i think everybody hope that hopefully we'll get some sort of resolution in this case because yeah i think it definitely can happen yeah. but yeah we'll definitely be following 
following the journey, following the rest of the podcast. Media pressure out now. Everywhere you get your podcasts, we'll have links for it below as well. Go check it out. Really great listen and uh, more to come on that. A uh, few more episodes coming. So There is one more thing I want yes. to get into. <laughs> um, first of all, I loved that you, it was, it was, it's really nice to hear from me as a creator that, you know, making this kind of content is helpful and we really encourage our audience to be what we call active true crime consumers and what that looks like. And, and to hear from a family member that something as small as sharing a missing person's flyer does go such a long way. I don't think people realize the power that they have as a consumer of this content to take these small steps. And, and some people take really big steps. So it's cool that, you know, there's a, a wide range of things that people can do, but ev- every little thing matters, even if it's going to a family's website or page or reaching out over email and just letting them know like I'm here with you I'm following the case I haven't forgotten I'm doing what I can like th- those things go a long way yeah um so I wanted to ask you more about your campaign you've started called engage with empathy what the objectives are and what that means to you and why you started that well I've been in this space for 20 years now and one thing that I noticed was there are is a lack of empathy in the true crime space. Definitely. And what that allows for is for consumers to take these stories in more as entertainment Mm -hmm. and forget sometimes, unwittingly, forget that these are real life tragedies dealing with real life people. And I think adding a little bit of empathy into the true crime space is the missing key there. And it's super easy to do. I haven't heard a single argument against it. There's no barriers to entry. Anyone can engage more empathetically. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I started the campaign just to see if, you know, people would respond to it. And they responded very positively. And so I created this really simple acronym. It's called CARE. And it's kind of the pillars of what the awareness campaign is meant to do. And so the C is center the victim. Mm -hmm. If the content that you're creating isn't victim-centered, then what's the point? And also understanding that as a creator, you have a responsibility to determine if the content that you're putting out is furthering the case or is it simply to entertain? Yeah. And I think that's relatively easy to make that distinct- distinction. Yeah. Um, the A is avoid harmful misinformation and wild speculation. Again, it's once something's put out on the internet, you can't take it away. Yeah. And then it spreads like wildfire and trying to contain something like that especially for a family that's actively trying to get resolution in their missing loved one's case, it's, it's, near, it's impossible. Yeah. I can tell you from experience, I've tried. Um, and even when I correct some misinformation with accurate information, people don't want to believe me because it doesn't fit their theory. You've already accepted this right. untruth. And so as consumers, what you can do is vote with your clicks. Mm-hmm. Right. You you know what content's out there that's slimy or is just salacious clickbait and you can vote with your clicks. And I'm seeing a shift in true crime as we speak where people are rejecting the more sensationalized escapism type of true crime. Yeah. And they want to get back to the victim. Um, and then, of course, the R is research responsibly. Uh, This is a big one because a lot of times people read something on the internet and just assume it's fact. Yeah. Well, there's a responsibility for creators and consumers to do their due diligence and make sure that they're looking at the sourcing and the veracity of that sourcing, looking at, um, you know, what's the purpose behind it. And, you can it will take a little time and it's it's not a passive thing and it takes a little work but in doing so you're preventing harm and unfair public indictments of innocent people by 
spreading untruths. I was going to say, this is very interesting. Do you think this, this clearly applies to unsolved cases, cases that are ongoing and currently happening, but what about cases that are solved, done, you know, the perpetrator's been convicted, they're in prison, because there's a lot of true crime content creators that cover strict, they stay away from the unsolved stuff for the very reasons that they don't want to run into these issues, but then they stick to the solved stuff because they think they're safe because it's already been wrapped up. You know, it's kind of the, you know, they have beginning, middle and end. There's already been There's a less trial with the facts. risks there. Yeah. What's your kind of thoughts on that and how this applies to solved cases? Well, it's an interesting argument. So in solved cases, who has the most at stake? Victims, families, the victim themselves. Right. It doesn't change. Yeah. Right. And so by retelling the story, are you actually doing more harm to those trying to live their life and move past the trauma? If you are, then I think... You know, there's an argument to be made against covering solved cases because are you trying to further the case? Or are you just trying to get clicks? What What is your purpose? Are you trying to explore a different avenue? Are you trying to look at it from a psychological perspective to prevent future crimes? Like you have to ask yourself, what is the intention of this coverage? Right. If it's good and pure and is going to help people, go for it. But if it's going to hurt people and re-victimize people i say you should think about that yeah. you should think about the impacts that your coverage is going to have and it's something i think you learn over time too i mean we've certainly um learned a lot in our our years and we're constantly trying to to do better and improve the way that we research and you know there's always room for improvement yeah um I it's think very it's, hard it's, about, it's hard it sometimes is. Yeah. it is but and our overall only... goal is to to be helpful not harmful right right I think the research part of it is difficult no matter who you ask because it's like we have access to a certain limited amount of resources you know and you can do your best but there is a chance that you're still going to get things wrong yeah, even from a very reputable source and i think that's you know unless you go and independently investigate every single case i do think there's always going to be that inherent risk of get, and hopefully the things you are getting wrong aren't like sending things in a totally different direction right there's like different i would say there's different levels of you know getting those things wrong but i think all these things are super important because there's straight up people out there that just disregard all these things and yeah they don't care well i don't think anyone's going for perfection i think people are people and as long as you're willing to admit mistakes and take accountability yeah who can fault you for that yeah agreed that's very true how can other creators out there learn more about this movement? Um, super simple. It's on my website, moramurraymissing.org, and there's a tab that lists all the uh, information about it. But it's it's an awareness campaign. So yeah. it's you know identifying c creators that are attempting to engage with empathy and you know, put a hashtag on there just so the yeah. word gets out. It's it's really simple. Um, I, it's just a way to shine a spotlight on the fact that I believe with a little more empathy infused into true crime, it can be a more positive experience. And um, it's such a powerful source for good. It is. And I'm not, I don't want to just always focus on the negative. I mean, I've been affected by creators who have engaged me with empathy and it's moved me uh and i saw the power in it and so i wanted to highlight it yeah i think i think what you're doing is so so needed this space needs a serious i don't even know what the word is tune up <laughs> um empathy boot camp <laughs> yeah empathy boot camp but i think we are getting there i think yeah. we are seeing progress more and more every day and it's really awesome and i love the the name engage with empathy. I think that's the perfect way to put it. And it's easy to remember. I love the acronym care. It's, it's really cool. I, I think that's, you know, with everything else you have going on for you to take the step to do something like this is, is really powerful. Oh, thank you. Well, Julie, it has been so nice to have you here. Um, come back anytime. You know, we, we are hoping there will be a day where you can come back and hopefully share some, some, 
positive updates. Yeah. Well, I appreciate you guys giving me this platform and always being so kind. And you're one of the empathetic creators that I, I mentioned, um, always focusing on the victim and giving family members space and not being able or afraid to admit mistakes and just moving forward and do better. As you learn, you, you do better. And I really appreciate it. And my whole family does. And I'm hoping that the next time I see you, we'll be in a different circumstance and talking about, you know, what's yeah. next because we found more. I do too. And thank you for saying that. That means a lot to me coming from you. Of Absolutely. Of course. Well, yes, be sure to check out Media Pressure. Again, we will have all the information on how to listen below. Episode five will have will already be out and episode six will be coming soon. So very exciting. And if you are um, interested in asking any questions, we will link whatever you guys have set up for uh, Q&A episode, which will be the last episode of the podcast. Yes. Excellent job again. Thank you for coming all the way out. Yes, we, thank we you appreciate so much. It's been so fun to hang out with you. Yeah, thank you guys for having me. I appreciate it. Of course, of course. That's going to be it for us today, you guys. Thank you so much for tuning in. We know that was a longer episode, but very um, interesting stuff. Lots of lots of information that we went over today. So thank Absolutely. you for sticking with us. Uh, we'll be back next week. But until then, I never know the outro for any of our shows. This is I like mix them all up. That was the intro for my show yeah <laughs> i say the intro for this or the outro for this show on the session anyway i'm rambling. anyways we'll but. see you guys <laughs> next time thank you